mobility a lot of times can just kind of get, I think, put into a box. And when you kind of apply something new or kind of unique or like a different style, I think like I do, that it's kind of like, oh, I've never seen or thought about this before. How do you get something to buy into the mobility aspect of things? It doesn't look gimmicky to me. It looks like you, it looks like there's a purpose. It looks like there's a whole program going on. If I'm not seeing what I want on a bodyweight squat, right? Why would I move on to like a goblet squat or like a weighted squat or like whatever? We've had different people come on the podcast and talk about increasing tendon strength, but what do you do with athletes to specifically work on that? How do you get people faster in the weight room? Because I think sometimes coaches will say, you can't teach speed. Okay, I think I hit the button. The wrong button, probably. <laughs> Or the right one. Oh, no. Maybe. Stop judging. Hey, appreciate you uh, taking the time to show us all that stuff in the gym. That was great. No, absolutely. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's awesome to be here. And you see some of the exercises that people do online, and I see some of the 90-90 hip stuff, and you kind of see people just kind of you know move their body around, which I'm sure is great because movement is movement, right? It's, it's nice, but you had a much more intense approach with some of it to the point where you were uh, yelling at us as if we were doing like heavy <laughs> squat reps, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think, uh, you know, that's a key. That's just personality-wise. That's kind of, uh, you know, what works for me. And I think especially, like, from an athletic standpoint, like, I probably wouldn't do that if I was working with someone that's, like, you know, a 70-year-old grandma. Or, you know what I mean? Like, realistic. <laughs> Come on, grandma. Yeah. Um, but I think, like I said, it works well, and it gets people, like, you you, uh, you meet people where they're at. So, like, okay, if I'm a competitive individual, all right, they're probably going to want to do things that are relatively competitive, relatively intense, things like that. So, like, from an athletic standpoint, that's what, you know, a lot of, you know, whether it's football, basketball, baseball, that kind of relates to you because you, you've been coached like that. You, you kind of have some level of intensity, enthusiasm. So I think that, um, you know, as we were talking about, mobility a lot of times can just kind of get, I think, put into a box of kind of like, uh, just like lie down, you know, roll around and like whatever, that when you kind of apply something new or kind of unique or like a different style, I think like I do, um, that it's kind of like, oh, I've never seen or thought about this before. Like mm -hmm. I thought we were just going to lie around on the whatever and you're kind of going intense or like whatever. Um, you know, so that's just something over the time that's worked really well for me. And, uh, you know, I've had pretty good success with it. I was really attracted to the stuff that I saw online that you were doing. You were doing so much work with so many people. Like you're having these uh, – looks like pretty young people and uh, I, I've coached myself uh, before I've coached some uh, high school kids and man it was so much fun but it was so challenging and I'm seeing these people uh, squatting with really good form and doing what I would consider to be complex exercises front squats box squats and you have unique ways of utilizing bands and chains and weight releasers and it doesn't look gimmicky to me. It looks like you. It looks like there's a purpose. It looks like there's a whole program going on, and I just love the enthusiasm. You're getting these guys all fired up, guys and girls. And um, what is it like? What does it take? How do you get control of the room when you first walk in? Because you've been a coach at many places now. When you first walk into a room of like thirty kids that just want to kind of dick around and, and throw rocks at each other and, and mess around with each other and not pay attention to the new guy. How do you kind of start out? How do you get their attention? Um, you know, that's a really good question. Uh, I think I'm pretty serious about what I do. Um, so I think when you're kind of, uh, I wouldn't call it, I guess, maybe in command or whatever, but like, okay, here's how we're going to do it. Here's how we're going to go about it. Now, I'm going to go about that different ways. So like I might come off like, you know, pretty serious on something or whatever, or I might start like kind of making some light jokes and now let's get into it, like whatever. But I'm also going to be, um, you know, as I, as I mentioned, if we're going to do something, I'm going to do it done a certain way. So it might not be perfect on day one, all right? But, you know, I've got it kind of where I, where I envision it going. So we need to be at certain steps when we're going to, going about that. So when I have, like, a large group, um, you know, trying to meet them, you know, just being honest, like, hey, Saturday morning, I know, hey, you guys want to – and this has been, you know, a realistic conversation I had with older uh, Division One football players. Like, it's a Saturday morning. It's 8 a.m., right? Do you just want to be here or do you want to get better? Because, like, I'll be honest, I really if, – if we're just going to mess around, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here at 8 a.m. just kind of like saying we were here. Because you know what? When we go play, it's not going to be something in a scorebook, uh, you know, 10 years from now that said, well, you know what? They were here on Saturday mornings doing extra work. It didn't make them better, but they were there. It's either going to be a win or a loss. And that's kind of how I view a lot of, I'll just be honest, you know, stuff in that realm. Of, so if we're going to be here, all right, hey, it's 30 minutes. We're going to lock in and we're going to get this done. Or I'll just be honest, you can leave. Like, it's fine. Like, you don't have to be here. But if you're going to be here, we're going to get better. Does everyone understand that? Like, and it's not like putting on, well, I just read some leadership book and like whatever. I'm like pretty serious. Like, I want to get this done. It's going to be done this way. And we're going to go about that. You know what I mean? So like, I think having those realistic like conversations and if someone hears that, like, oh, you know what I mean? You get some people that may be like, uh, whatever. But a lot of times people are like, lock in and let's get to work. You know what I mean? Same with the younger kids. I'm like, hey, like, uh, 
come talking to them where they're at, like, what do you guys, you know, what do they, what do they want to improve? A lot of them just want to lift and they want to learn and they mm-hmm. want to get better on that stuff. All right. So, Hey, like, let's lock in, let's focus. Why are we talking right now? Like, why are we doing this other stuff? And then as we get better, like I said, as you advance in, in a lot of this stuff, then like a lot of stuff that you're seeing, um, not necessarily like in that clip, but like some other stuff. I mean, that wasn't stuff that we just started with. You know what I mean? That was stuff that was advanced and progressed to. And that's kind of how the process happens. Um, you know, so like, as you see like seventh and eighth grade girls, there going over on our lateral stuff. There's fifth, sixth graders. Um, you know, when you can listen, you can pay attention, you can focus on that stuff that allows everything else to happen. You know what I mean? It's very, the teaching aspect, I'll be honest, I feel very confident in that. So like when I, the plan that I have, the teaching, the coaching, I feel very confident in that. The problem is when there's not, people aren't listening, they're not focusing. Mm -hmm. That just takes a long time. Like there was a really good quote and I can't remember, um, the book, but it was, uh, it was a first grade teacher. And she said, I need first graders that can come in and listen and sit still. And then I can teach them numbers and letters. It's not the other way around. Like I need, I need first graders and come in, sit still and listen, focus, and then I can teach you everything. It's kind of the same. I'll be honest. I've applied that a lot with myself of like, if we can just listen, pay attention, I feel very confident. It might not be perfect or you might, I might not know how to do something, but I feel confident. I'm going to learn. I'm going to, I'm going to put the time and the effort in to try and get this to be the best that it can. All right. So I think that's just uh, looking at it like that. And then just being open and transparent. Like I want you to get better. Like I really want you to get better. But if you're you're talking, you're messing around. Like we can't. There is no secret. There is no secret plan. There's no secret exercise. Like if you're trying to do whatever it is that we're doing, like some of those mobility or what other drills. But you're talking, you're having a conversation. Mm-hmm. You're not gonna. You're you're really not able to push yourself to the level you need to get better. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. And I think that's where if you can start harnessing the focus, the the attention to detail on that stuff, that makes the whole training process so much easier. In, in just in just my opinion. So like if we're not going uh, the way that I want, okay, let's stop. Like we're either not gonna do it or we're going to be done or whatever. But like, there's going to be like a certain, um, I guess, standard, if you will, of like, this is how it's going to be done. And this is just how I'm going to run it. You know what I mean? Um, and maybe that's me, you know, yelling, maybe that's me having a converse, like joking, maybe that's whatever it is. But like, if we're doing it, it's going to be done at a really high level. And that's, that's just how I'm going to go about it. So I think that's, uh, you know, and to be honest, I think everyone's got a different personality. I think maybe my personality is unique if you want to call it that you know what i mean that's just that's just who i am and i think whether it was college junior high, high like whatever i think i'm just different you know personality wise than most people you know what i mean so like i i probably can't explain it very well but i think like oh you're kind of unique you're you know like whatever like i think that when i say something man i haven't heard a coach you know be that kind of honest before or whatever okay mm. well now you're probably listening differently mm. and it, 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 it resonates mm. differently if you will I don't know about you guys, but I'm jealous like of those kids that get trained by him. Imagine having such a great coach at mm-hmm. such a young age. Yeah, I didn't have that much in college. <laughs> <laughs> Even in high school, I didn't have a strength and conditioning coach like that. Um, but an interesting thing that um, I'm kind of curious about is you you work with all these kids, and you were talking a little bit to us in the gym about how you kind of get them to pay attention because there's a mm-hmm. lot of them at one time. I think a lot of coaches may struggle with that, trying to get kids to actually do what you need them to do, but all of them doing what you need them to do. And then the other thing is, is when you see a lot of these clips on your page with them doing a lot of these complex movements, it's surprising to see young kids working with load and look so good with it. They all look extremely proficient. So how did you set that up? And the reason why I'm asking this is because we've had different people on the podcast work with kids in terms of S and C. And, you know, some people don't think that kids should be working with squats and deadlifts and that type of thing at a younger age. They think it actually negatively affects them athletically. But if all the kids were doing the things like you show them in these videos, all these kids would be just fine. So how how do you how do you get this set up? Um I think it starts with having like a long-term process or long-term plan in place. So when I'm working with like say a 12, 13, 14, whoever it is, mm-hmm. right? I'm looking, you know, 3, 4, 5 years down the line, right? So what we're doing, you know, for this, you know, month, 2 month, 3 month, it sets everything else down the line. So like the example I'll use is if you can't squat very well, all right? How, like, if I want to get two years from now and I want to do like a, like an accommodating resistance session, because that's, what's needed to get your vertical from 33 to 34.5, but you don't squat very well. How well is that going to, how well is that going to work? Like you have to be able to squat well Mm -hmm. to be able to get the the specific modalities that you're probably going to need. Right. So starting with that, like if I can't add very well, if I struggle with just basic uh, addition, subtraction, when I get to algebra, I'm going to struggle big time. So I try and take like, Hey, if I'm looking, if we're, we're starting with our body weight squats. I want it to look pretty much perfect. It's challenging when you have a large number of individuals because everyone's going to be a different level. But the nice thing is, is like if you spend an extra week or two doing bodyweight squats with a 12 or 13-year-old, 
it's fine. Like they're they're going to get benefit out of it. They don't need to rush. And I think people want to rush too quick on stuff. Yeah, I don't need to rush. If I got six years to train someone before they even go to college, we can take an extra week, two weeks, three weeks. I can take a month. But like kind of the point we were talking about earlier, it's going to be done at a really high level. That's just the standard. So like, okay, if I'm not seeing what I want on a body weight squat, right? Why would I move on to like a goblet squat or like a weighted squat or like whatever? So like, you know, that's a really good example of just, you know, in, I think that was two years, seventh grade, 2021, freehand front squat. All right. To, uh, you oh, know, nice. that was a, and you see the fight and the thing I'm really, the thing right there. All right. That's a seventh grader to a freshman. Right. But do you see how he struggles and see how he stays in, he doesn't cheat his depth. Look at the last, that last one. It's unbelievable. And he maintains amazing position. And then good job by the spotter, no, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The spotter knows what's up, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but like, you got to let him strain. You but know? part of skill is not just like, okay, you can do the movement, but like, okay, it gets, that's like a max lift. What does your technique look like under a relative, like, heavy max lift? Most times, what you see with kids is like, it gets heavy. And what does their, what does their squat depth do? They cut it. They cut it and they cheat it. And mm-hmm. I told them, like, and this, like, before that and other ones, and again, just being honest, my personality, I, you know, kind of went on to like a little, uh, what you call it, 300 speech before, uh, like, whatever. I'm like, I told him, oh, like, hey, here's the deal. There is no honor in putting more weight on the bar and doing a quarter squat. There's zero honor in a weight room. You can go to any weight room in America. There's and no, he there's the kid no, in the chest there's and no, he fell off a cliff. There is, <laughs> Sparta! There is no honor. I said, you know what there is honor in is? It's heavy. You go down, you might miss it, but at least that's honorable. That's honorable in the weight room to do your same squat that you always do, and you miss the rep, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, boom, I talk about that, whatever. And, you know, and they've been squatting for so long that when you only know one way to do something, you don't see people deviate too far out of it for the most part. You know what yeah. I mean? So, like, okay, you've been doing squats for two years now. Now it gets heavier or whatever. You're not going to probably see someone just like, man, I've never seen that before, you know, whatever. But that just comes from the reps and the reps and, like, all the time spent doing bodyweight squats doing goblet squats, doing freehand front squats, doing, you know what I mean? Like all that other stuff. Um, so that's what, like, I look at from a skill standpoint. All right, what do we look like when it gets heavier? What are we looking at? Like all these other stuff. So like that example right there, you saw the first one was like a six second lower, if I remember correctly, which we spent a bunch of time, slow eccentrics, long pauses. Cause that's not just from a, uh, preparing the tissues and, and what we're looking at from an adaptation with that. It's a learning process. When you have to go slow, you're feeling your body in those positions. You're understanding how to do the movement correctly. Right. Mm-hmm. Most of the time what I see is people will do squats, pushups, other stuff, but it's just done fast. It's, there's no control. There's no positions. So you might be doing it, but you're not actually learning like the positions. Now, as we go, it's funny because I would get people comments like, oh, how, how long do you do all these slow lowers for or whatever? And then like you saw that second video, people are like, man, they're squatting weight. They're going out way too fast. Like, what do you do? Like, boom, boom, boom. I'm like, literally like a couple of years ago, I had people saying, you're going too slow. You're doing too much of this. And I got people saying, you're going too fast. Right. That was part <laughs> of the plan. Like the internet, that, that right there. <laughs> and, uh, and I talk about like rapid eccentrics, right? The faster you can move eccentrically is extremely important from an athletic standpoint. Like you eccentric peak velocity is a key component that I look at like with force plates and other stuff. So like the faster I can eccentrically load, the more basically elastic energy I potentially have the opportunity to use. So you look at someone, uh, a world-class football player or whatever, when they're coming into a cut at high velocity, there's a ton of eccentric velocity, right? You have somebody that can't run that fast. They're either having to slow down or they're like, whatever, right? If you can't make cuts at high velocity, it mm. really limits your ability to be very, very good at the highest levels. So when like that example right there, that wasn't, I don't start, I don't do rapid eccentrics with kids that are learning. You've got to develop and we take time and like whatever. And now when I want this uh, specific adaptation that I need in the program, I can do it because I can squat good. I understand how to do it correctly. All right. So now I can go. So like that, that example right there, like that kid, um, I think he was at like a 27 vert, if I remember correctly. I think he did uh, like 33, eight or 34. So he went from seventh grade to freshman, 30, 30, like seven inches or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. And so not saying it's all entire, you know what I mean? The program or whatever, but like, okay, now he's 33, eight. I want 36. Now I want 38 and I want, you know, and you know what, we might not get there, but like, that's kind of the, at least my philosophy, like we're trying to push performance to keep going up. All right. If you just, if we want to be lackadaisical, I don't care if you're a freshman in high school or you're a world-class NFL player or whatever, like as a coach, if you're, if you're working with a coach, it's not very like, kind of like, oh, well, okay. Like whatever. Like I want to work with people at least, and this is me uh, just personally, I want to work with people that want to push me to be my absolute best. Mm. So if I'm working with a coach, that's like, I want this and this, and we're going to push to that. You're probably going to get your best performance out of yourself. Right. I think I veered off significantly from whatever the, from whatever the original question was. Um, Oh, how do you get kids to uh, like, whatever. So like keeping that in mind. So like trying to, like I said, look at the long-term play. And then, like I said, if I'm not seeing a good body weight squat, we'll stay, we'll spend extra time doing it. All right now we're going to goblet, right? The, one of the things that I do is I always go heels elevated when I'm teaching the squat, right? And people will say, why do you that? start? Yeah, why do you do that? I'm like, well, here's the thing. 
there's a lot of kids that don't need it. But like, if I have a group of 40 kids, let's just put everybody on, on, the, on it because there's going to be kids that need it on there. Mm. It's very hard to individualize training when you're starting to work with kids and you have a large group. But if everyone's just doing the exact same thing, hey, even if you don't need to have your heels elevated, I mean, those are uh, freshmen in uh, college, mm. but you can see like right there and that's what it should look like. Um, and I'll be honest, I have, you know, freshmen in high schools that are doing more weight than that. And those are freshmen in college, division one football players. Mm. Um, but like to that point of, uh, you know, I put everybody heels elevated. Okay, we learn how to do it. We learn how to push our knee forward. We learn how to sink down. It's an easier movement. Okay, now as we go, I might, um, I might say, okay, hey, I, I, after I've watched for a couple of weeks, I can kind of tell, okay, you 15 or 20, I want you guys to take your heels off the board. So now the whole group of 40 is running, all right? And that's a sixth grade girl with, was it a 50 pound dumbbell? But you know mm-hmm. what I mean? But like now, so like this was, I think a month ago, she's doing- It's uh, an incredible form. Her back is, couldn't yeah, be any straighter. But, and I, I think I've got a video, I haven't posted it, but I think she can do, she was doing a 60 pound dumbbell flat footed. Mm. So like that's sixth grade, you know what I mean? Uh, mm-hmm. That's got to make her confident playing her sport. Oh, absolutely. You know, throwing and, around 60 pound and, dumbbell. And, I, and, I, and I'll go to that example. And the thing that is, I really enjoy working with younger kids specifically, it's like, they're like, I'm hearing them. And that's when you know they enjoy it. Cause it's like, you're walking around coaching, whatever. And then they're like talking to the group, like, okay, we did a 40 pound dumbbell. Like, let's try and do a 45 next week. Like, whatever. I'm like, okay, like you're, they're, they're making their own goals in their head. Yeah. You know what I mean? Which is a big thing. So, like, a good example, too, kind of with that is. I think there's a, a like a coaching aspect of uh, – so, like, if I have a kid, and this is one that happened recently. I had a, a fifth, sixth grade uh, girl that i uh, been doing body weight, body weight, like, on the, on the split squats. And I was like, oh, you can grab weight if you want to. She stayed with body weight, was doing good, whatever. The next week, I look over and I'm like, wait, she's got a 20-pound dumbbell. I'm like, <laughs> she just grabbed, went over and grabbed it herself. She, you, and you know, she's feeling confident yeah. in herself to go grab that, all right? And then uh, even though, like – Half the reps were good. There was ones where I was like, realistically, I would have been probably gone maybe a 10 or a 15, mm-hmm. whatever. But I was like, okay, this is like a big step. Like she had the confidence to go get that. If I come over and be like, oh no, see how we should probably go down to a 10. How's that going to feel to like a 12 year old? Like, oh man, I tried something and it didn't work good. Okay. You know what? Like I probably would have gone less. We're not going to get hurt doing this. We're fine. This is good for right now. When we come back next week, then I'm going to come back and we'll see what she grabs. And I might be like, hey, why don't we grab like a 10 or 15? And like, I just want to see this that week. So I'm not saying that what you did bad last week was bad, but now I'm kind of coming back. Let's go here. Like whatever. So like, those are kind of like the, the micro kind of what's kind of going on in my head when I'm seeing that stuff. It, now you get times too, where you get like the kids that like, oh, here's a 70 pound. Like, no, no. Yeah. Put the set, like, no, your technique is like, you're not, you know what I mean? But every situation, every, you're, 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 that's what coaching is. At least mm-hmm. in my opinion is like, you're trying to, what's the individual, like, what, what do they need to imp- to progress? Sometimes it's just confidence. Like you're crushing that. Like you can do another 20 pounds, like easily. You know what I mean? Cause you get some kids that they just want to like go less or like be comfortable. And it's like, they just need that. Like, no, you can do more. Try, like, I don't, and part of it helps me too is like, and I tell them like, how diligent am I on technique? Very, like very. I'm like, so if I'm telling you, I think you can go up on 20 pounds. If I do, if I'm doing that, mm. do you think I'm going to let you see like a bad squat or whatever? Like, no, I'm like, I believe I, I trust in you. And I think that's where it comes. Like when you have like a high standard and I say something like that, it's like, I'm not just like, you know, trying to, Hey, put 50 pounds on. Let's see how it goes. Yeah. Like I said, I try and keep that standard high. So I think the kids, I kind of like a light bulb, like, Oh, I think you're right. And then they do it. And it's like, I'll be honest. You probably could have done that for two more reps. Like whatever, you know what I mean? So like, that's kind of how I try and build like confidence and like kind of repertoire, um, you know, with kids and like kind of just being honest and transparent, like I said, with that stuff. But I think the confidence and that other stuff is really big. And then just like I said, um, you know, with large groups trying to set it up to like, okay, we're going to keep working, uh, to make sure it's really good. And we might take an extra couple of weeks doing it, but I want to solidify it and now we'll move on. And I'm not scared to regress. So like a good example, um, like with my freshman football, like I didn't like how our back, they started learning how to back squat end of eighth grade. We went into the summer. <clears throat> Right. And I was kind of running around doing coaching. You know, I couldn't be around them all the time. In the summer, I was just like, you know what? I don't like, I'm just like, man, I don't like how our back squats are looking. Mm. So I like, hey, here's what we're doing. Football season started. We're going back to freehand front squats. And I know you've been doing it for two years. I don't care. The back squats don't look how they want. We're not doing this or whatever. I don't care if we have to spend another year doing freehand front squats. It's going to be done at the level that I want and I expect. And like, whatever. We went a month cleaned up some stuff, looked great, going to back squat. Back squats have been great since. Mm -hmm. So I'm not like, okay, freehand front squats was a big regression. But hey, you know what? The back squats, they're not looking how I want, and they're not what I expect. So I'm not scared. Like I said, and still you're 14, 15 years old. Okay, 
we'll spend another couple months regressing or whatever. Yeah. It's not the, not the end of the world. Um, but like I said, that's what I, if, if I want something done, it's going to be done at a high level. So if I have to regress to get there, we're going to do that. And I think that's kind of one of the the standards, hopefully the kids or whoever I'm working with kind of see if like, it's going to be done at a super, super high level. Yeah. How do you give them like a little bit of autonomy um, and just make them feel, I know you're not there to like necessarily just make them feel good all the time, but how do you like, you know, you got the, maybe the couple of kids maybe that are uh, kind of behind you know, the form's not there. It's just, they're just not ready. And they really want to do some weights. Do you um, maybe have them uh, utilize uh, maybe a different weight rather than like a barbell on the back or something like that? Yeah. So I would say kind of two parts on that. So I would do, first of all, like probably like uh, either a dumbbell, uh, like variation of whatever we're doing, go lighter. Um, so there are times where I'll be like, like a Bulgarian split squat, where I'll be like, I'll show them like the first time we do it. I'm like, okay, if you want to go to like a, we've done it before, but we're going to a barbell. Cause I want to increase the load. Um, also cause like a lot of times like with, uh, you know, kids in general, like the grip is your limiting factor. Like when you're holding dumbbells. So it's like, okay, like with the Bulgari, like if you're doing it with a barbell, like a, fr- a front squat grip, you can overload it more cause your grip's not going to be as big of an issue. Yeah. So like that, that's an example of like, I would go to that and I'd be like, here's the deal. There's a lot more like <laughs> it's relatively safe, but like your balance, there's a lot more. You don't, if you have dumbbells, you can drop them. Barbell mm-hmm. is different. If you don't feel comfortable with that, perfectly fine. Stay with dumbbells. Anybody that wants to try and go with the barbell, you can go ahead and do that today. So, whichever one you want to do, you can go ahead and do that. So, I'll do stuff like that. You know what I mean? Where it's kind of giving them the option. And it might be like they stay with dumbbells for two weeks and then they go to the, the, the barbell, if you will. Um, so, that's one way, uh, dropping it down. Um, and then I'll be honest, I think the other thing too is like my biggest, my biggest things is, if you can show up and you just show up and you, you want to work hard and you want to get better, that's honestly like one of the, probably the most, that's the most important thing, mm-hmm. especially with younger kids. Like I'm just like, you know, the perfect program, you know, the perfect exercises. Um, but like to a certain degree, if, if, if you, if you show up and I think it's a life skill, honestly, like showing up and like, man, I want to get better today. Like if you show up to school and I know it's kind of like, uh, might sound redundant, but like, if you kind of show up, man, I hate school, like whatever, like boom, boom, boom. Yeah. How, how well do you think you're going to do in it? You know what I mean? If you show up, like and I say, like you show up to the weight room, I'll be honest. If you just kind of go through the motions right now when you're 12, 13, 14 years old, you'll make some progress because it's the first time you've ever done, you picked up a dumbbell. You're going to get to a point though where you can't just show up. Like you can't, you have to show up and you have to have a level of focus. You have to work hard. When you go into life, like business or whatever, if you kind of just show up kind of like eh, not really great attitude or whatever, you're, you're going to set yourself back significantly. All right. So when I have kids and I, and, and this is one of the biggest things I think is really important is I try and give praise or I give praise, not necessarily like, oh, you squat the most, you bench the most or whatever. I, I try and praise great technique, but also, you know what? Like I take a lot of pride in the kids and I'm very proud of the kids that show up and they're not the biggest, they're not the strongest, but they show up every day. They were, I, some of those kids, I, I was with you at 8 a.m. in the summer when you were mm-hmm. in seventh, you didn't have to be here. Mm-hmm. That, and, I, and I'll highlight them, not just to them, to the entire group, like 60 kids, like, hey, you know what? He's running around everywhere. He is going, he has a sense of urgency when he comes in. He wants to get better. And I don't care if you squat, you bench press 65 pounds or 265 pounds. All right. If you show up every day and you work hard, you want to get better and you keep doing the best, whatever your best is. And you keep giving that, that 65 pounds, it's going to go to 70. It's going to go to 75. You're going to get more reps. It's going to come. All right. I know it can be difficult, but if you just show up and do your best every day, you're going to make the progress. And I think that's one of the things I really try and highlight. Cause I have a lot of kids that'll stay, they'll pick up, you know what I mean? Like we have specific ways that I want stuff turn in the weight room. So like the, the way the weights are turned, the way that the kettlebells are lined up, like all that stuff, the benches have to be lined up a specific way. Mm-hmm. And I'll have a lot of kids that they're going to pick up other areas that aren't theirs. So it's not their responsibility. And I tell them like, if you go out into life and you're, you're, you're doing stuff for, you're picking up other people's areas. Do you know how valuable that is as a company, as a business, whatever? No one told you to do that. Yeah. And you know what? People might look past or whatever, but I respect that. And I really appreciate that. Like, and I'll highlight them in front of other people, like their, their peers, other coaches, like it has nothing to do with your skills or your abilities, but like, that's the stuff that I really appreciate. Like, Hey, you're helping that person doesn't know what they're doing, but they showed up for the first time today, but you went over there and helped them and showed them. Like, I want to highlight that because you're doing a great job. So that's one of the things I really try and, uh, you know, do a lot, do as best as I can, honestly, is to try and highlight that because I think those are the important life skills. And those are the stuff from an environment standpoint that is like probably one of the best things from a team atmosphere. You know what I mean? When you have everybody kind of like wanting to be their best, regardless of whatever their best is, that's how you get these high performance environments when people are just trying to drive and, and be the best they can. So like, mm-hmm. that's how, that's uh, kind of how I go about it. And I try to just really highlight and, you know, um, you know, praise the stuff that I want to see um, or stuff that's going to be really beneficial, um, you know, for the long term. 
Yeah. Do do your kids, the word kids that you work with, do they end up thinking long term about things? Because, for example, when we were just talking about the squat and with a lot of videos on your page, you show a video from maybe 2020 with a kid and then 2023 and you'll see that progression. And when a lot of people, let's say that they started lifting or being in the gym as an adult, they want to go straight to back squatting. They, they, you don't set up the preliminary box squats. You don't do the air squats. You don't do any of the free, the free hand front squats. It's just straight to the back squat, cut depth, and you just keep loading weight from there, right? Whereas if you had a two-year goal of being able to then squat 225 with perfect form, most people wouldn't be injured by doing certain things in the gym. So, like, do your kids end up, Jesus Christ, what? You got to watch the whole progression, though. <laughs> eighth grader. But, yeah, do, do they just, do you drill that in that long-term thinking with them? Um, yeah, I think, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, yeah, I think I, I try and use highlights. So like, I think one of the things that's helped me out a lot, to mm -hmm. be honest, is, uh, is my experience at the collegiate level. So yeah. like, it's one thing when you kind of say stuff, it's another thing like, mm -hmm. so like Jordan loves like a really good example. I think I got one of his videos on there. I should, um, I don't know where, oh, that's a softball player. Uh, Andrew, he also has a YouTube channel too, if you okay. need more content to uh, be able to find. Uh, but like, so when you could be like. Okay, I worked with Jordan Love mm -hmm. when he was a freshman through for three and a half years. So I yeah. literally, and this isn't, um, this is just the reality of like, Jordan came in at 177 pounds and never lifted and was just very small and very weak, but he moved really, really well. And then he goes from like, you know, struggling to a barbell to like two and a half years later, he's put on 45 pounds and he's full front squat in 350. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, so I've seen that. I've literally, and there was, the nice thing with that is like quarterbacks was my main position group. There might have been, but like pretty much whenever Jordan Love came in the weight room, I was like, I, I was there the whole time. So I saw that process play out. You know what I mean? So like when people want to like rush through stuff with a 12 or 13 or 14, I've, I've literally seen with my own very eyes that process play out. Like putting mm -hmm. 45 pounds on in like two and a half years of like, you're like just the, the, the pictures speak for themselves, but the strength, the other stuff of, uh, what was that? I think that was 335. Yeah. So Jordan that was in the summer. So how old was he with the with the weight gain from what year to what year? Uh, that was 2016 to 2018. You know how old he was? Um, so he was, uh, he came in early. So we graduated early. So he was 17. He was 17 when he uh, got to college. So 17 yeah. to 19, I want to say. 45 so, pounds, good body yeah. composition. Uh, yeah. Jesus. So, yeah. I'll show you guys the, the picture. I don't know if I have it online, but like, yeah. like literally like you, and the thing is you can see the, like, that's the thing that's helped with like the squat, whatever. Like you see the legs are like twigs to like, his legs are like just tree trunks. And I'm like, you see the VMO just popping off, popping off the bone. I'm like, this is the process, like literally just slow and steady, keep, but you have to work really hard, be consistent. And so like, that's the thing. Okay. I worked at Texas tech. I worked at like with these, you know, NFL guys or whatever. Mm -hmm. Terrence Steele's a great example. Um, you know, uh, he's the offensive tackle for the Cowboys. So Terrence Steele, uh, was an undrafted free agent, right? He went from being an undrafted free agent to starting for the, for the Dallas Cowboys at right tackle. For the last three years, he's maybe missed a couple starts, but he's right now probably one of the best right tackles in the NFL, going from an undrafted free agent. But you know what set Terrence apart is he's six six, super hard worker, great like whatever. I've got pictures of Terrence six a.m. workouts, those same drills that were those ninety ninety. Mm -hmm. I've got pictures of Terrence at five forty six a.m. just in the weight room, fourteen minutes before the, nobody's in the weight room. He doesn't even know I'm taking. This isn't like where like you're posing for. Mm -hmm. I'm in the, like, I just wanted to like, he's there 14, the he's there 14 minutes early in his 90, 90 stretch. Mm -hmm. Cause that's what he was told. This is what you need to focus on to get better. Yeah. How many people do you know that show up just right at six, eight? There's a lot. Or how many people show up late or whatever? How many people were there at a lift 15 minutes before it starts doing something so minute and so small? Mm -hmm. I've got other ones at four, five forty four. You know what I mean? Like these are in like January and February when nobody knew who he was, but that's who he was. That was him doing everything he could to make himself better. And that's how you go from being an undrafted free agent to starting for the last three years and just about to make a bunch of money yeah. for the Dallas Cowboys. But like, those are the little things that I can tell, like when I say, tell kids or like whatever, I'm like, this is the stuff like that separates. And I'm not saying you'll go play in the NFL or whatever, but like mm -hmm. those are the, people are doing that. And if you're not doing that and you're not as talented, what's going to happen when you step on the field court, whatever it is. So like coming back to the original question of like being able to draw on those like real world experiences of like NFL guys, major league baseball guys or whatever, here's the process. And it'd be one thing if you don't have that, like, oh, okay, like whatever, when I can show pictures and I can show this, like, mm -hmm. Hey, I'll, literally I'll pull out, here's, here's him squatting a buck 35. You know what I mean? And he was three years older or like some of the, the ones that helped too, like with the girls of like, I had a lot of like division one, uh, you know, softball and, and, uh, soccer girls that like they were starting 
body weight or freehand front squat with a barbell, like day one of college as a freshman, right? I've got seventh grade girls that do that now. Oh, ooh, those are the old, okay, those are some old. So you'll see, it's actually interesting how my training philosophy has changed. So I think that was like 2014. Oh, okay. Um, but like, it was a lot more like Olympic, uh, Olympic based. Um, I just saw soccer. So uh, I just, no, pa- yeah. just pause for just a second. Um, you, so you don't use Olympic lifts oh, no, uh, I do. much I do. now. Okay. Oh, I do. Um, I'm saying, uh, I was very, uh, so like in that video you're showing right there, um, it was very snatch clean jerk. Like there was a variation every day mm-hmm. and it was very Olympic, a very, oh. very Olympic based. I still use it, but not nearly to the extent of, uh, to that. If Why'd you, will. you abandon some of that? Um, I'll be honest. I think it was kind of one of those things where it was like, kind of, uh, you look at the numbers. I'm like, okay, is this really, is this, am I seeing, if I don't do this, am I still going to see the same improvements relatively? And I'm not saying right, wrong or different. Every situation is different. Um, I was just kind of like, you know what? I think I could, allocate time a little bit differently. So I think time's always going to be one of your biggest limiting factors. So if I have an hour and say I'm going to spend, you know, 12 to 15 minutes of it doing, you know, snatches, I'm not saying I'm not against that or whatever, but I can't be necessarily sprinting or I can't be doing some plyometrics in that 10 to 15 minutes. All right. And I think one of the things that's kind of changed for me a lot, probably over the last like three, four years, just kind of looking at stuff is like from an athleticism standpoint, how well the individuals that can move fast, change direction, move fluently and well mm-hmm. are generally the ones that are very good in sports. You know what I mean? So like, okay, if we're doing like our sprint work or our plyometrics or the other stuff, um, you know, I see that translating. If I have a limited amount of time, I see that translating more so then and I'm not, I'm not trying not to come off as like anti, like I love him. I've competed in Olympic weightlifting. Um, I love it, but I'm just saying from those examples of, I generally would rather allocate my time doing that stuff. Right. That's just my personal opinion. Um, I'm not against it. I, I've seen good results. Like I said, using it before mm-hmm. or whatever, but that's just kind of the, the rationale. And the maybe reason. if you're more one-on-one, maybe you would oh, yeah, exactly. go back to utilizing Exa- that more and, often. And I think actually that's a really good point. Cause you'll get kids that like, there's a teaching or whatever, but you'll get, you know, you got 30 kids and you might have like 10 to 12 that over, you know, a couple, like th- they'll pick it up good. But then you got the five to 10 that are just still bad at it. And like, okay, like you go through like say snatches and like, okay, you're doing like tens on each side. Cause you don't understand the movement. Like how much power are you really producing? Cause you're still, and I understand, and I, I've got some pretty good at what I think are pretty good progressions, regressions or whatever, but you still get to the point where it's like, okay, well, how much, like, we've been doing, like, a month now. I don't really know that this you is, can, this is, this is know. getting you better. You know Regress I mean? so far that you're not even doing yeah. anything similar to the And I can't exercise. individually coach that one individual mm-hmm. all the time. So that's kind of, that's kind of honestly the rationale why. So, like, that's a good example. Um, that was a soccer player, but that, what is that, 175 for a pause? So we, you know, we, we pretty, com- we come pretty accustomed to, uh, you know, young men training and lifting. But that's still like a relatively new thing. Like I think that people don't really realize strength and conditioning is still like it's a it's a new profession in some way. You know, it hasn't been around that long. Um, but how do you feel about uh, girls training and just I guess the even uh, children in general just training at young ages? Yeah. So I'll start that with uh, depth. I'll, <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, these insane. girls are unbelievable. So I'll start. I'll start with uh, girls. So I think most of my. I'll be honest. A lot of my experience. Um, it's like I think that was like one of our clean uh, progressions: the pull and the clean and the ISO. Um, but uh, uh, most of my experience, or a lot of my experience, has been with like girl. Like women's soccer is probably one of the sports I worked with the most of any mm-hmm. sports from the colleges, from NAI Division Two, uh, Division One. Um, so that's where a lot of my experience comes from. Uh, Honestly, so I think it's extremely valuable, and I think that's kind of one of the things where you're seeing a change too. Um, where it used to be very just like football, you you do strength and conditioning because you play football. Mm-hmm. Now you're starting to see other sports a lot more, kind of like see the value in it. And I think kind of the same same um, for uh, female sports as well is that when you you look at like the benefits, first of all, from an injury standpoint, and like what can you do from an ACL standpoint, and uh, you know a knee injury standpoint in general, but also from a performance standpoint, like speed development strength, plyometrics, like how all that kind of correlates, whether it's volleyball, soccer, basketball, mm-hmm. all those kind of physical attributes that go into it from a training standpoint. So I think you're starting to see a better shift too in terms of like value, in terms of like at a younger age with like uh, girls and female athletes and, and the benefit in it of it, uh, you know, as well. And with kids, I think uh, we talked about it a little bit uh, earlier is that I think I'm I'm a big proponent in in kids, you know, lifting and working out and, and having, uh, you know, getting involved into it. I think the, the thing that's can be a challenge now is cause just with social media and just kind of just stuff in general, kids see stuff and they want to think about, you know, I need to be doing this or trying this or whatever it might be. Um, and I think that's kind of where it becomes trying to more educate in that sense of like, there's a lot of kids that like want to get into the gym now that are like 12, 13, 14 years old. Whereas like, I didn't really didn't start lifting until I was probably about like 
I think a sophomore in high school. So like mm. 16 years old, you know what I mean? What was that 15, 16 years ago? Um, which is probably common, you know what I mean? Like whatever. Now you're getting kids that are 11, 12, 13. It's like, I think I was telling you like earlier, like, you know, you get like, oh, do we high bar or low bar back squat? Mm. Like, wait, what? How old you How do you 13? How do you know that? Like, mm. you know what I mean? Like I didn't know that till college. Like, so you're getting kids that are like, you're, you're, where'd you learn that at? YouTube or whatever, or wherever yeah. it is. Yeah. So you're seeing more of that kind of uh, perch, um, kind of come about, you know what I mean? Just with the way uh, things are. So I think it's very beneficial to teach kids and, and, and instruct that stuff. Cause I think that's the other problem that I see is a lot of, I see a lot of kids working, lifting out, going to commercial gyms and other stuff, but like it's some of the technique is really, really bad. And what you generally see is like people, I just want to lift more weight and like you, you sacrifice form and technique and they're not looking long-term, you know what I mean? Which is, we all, <laughs> We all weren't thinking long term mm -hmm. when we started lifting. It was like I just want to lift more weights, or I want to get bigger, stronger, like mm -hmm. whatever it is. So I think that's where the coaching aspect comes in. Of like, I'm not going to set you like I don't really max with like younger kids. Like, okay, we might try and like after we get to a certain level of competency, okay, we'll do some like rep maxes, like a five rep max maybe, or like you know something like along those lines. But I'm not really not trying to like push the outer limits of your capacities right now when you don't have a good skill set. If that makes sense. Um, excuse me. So like that's uh, one of the big things, and I think uh, trying to just uh, teach them that, uh, you know, technique matters. You know what I mean? I think that's kind of going back to the standard of like, when I have as high standards for technique and the other stuff mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, that they can see down the line, like how that's going to be beneficial and how it's going to help them squat more weight, bench more weight, whatever it might be, uh, you know, kind of with that. So I think it's, it's key, like I said, to try and teach and educate. Cause I think that's a lot of teaching doesn't just happen in three weeks. Like you can't teach someone to squat three weeks and like, okay, Hey, <laughs> Go go at it. Go 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 load the bar up. You know what I mean? Like it's yeah. a, it's a it's a long process, and I think that's one of the things that it is going back to like the Olympic lifting example. So I was at uh, Lindenwood University, which is where like if you're f uh, familiar with Fran Fernando Reyes, um, who competed for Brazil, um, you know over numerous Olympic cycles, um, you know was probably one of the best you know or strongest uh, weightlifters in North America. So I saw a lot like some high level high high level training training happen from an Olympic lifting standpoint, and like it was really interesting that when you have a, a high level of technique you can't, you don't see much fluctuation from it. Like mm -hmm. even there was an example like Fernando, who's, I think he snatched like 200 kilos. I think his best clean and jerk is like 240, 245 kilos. It could be off on that. But like, there was one time I was training and like, he, he took a video, it was like 160 kilo snatch. And he's like, hey, come over here, look at this video. You see how right here, the bar gets away from me just a little bit. Like if that was 170 or 175, I would have missed it. <clears throat> 160 wasn't heavy enough or whatever, but I was able to make it. And I'm like looking at this, I'm like, yeah, Jesus. I don't see, I, that, that bar looks like it's literally like right mm -hmm on your body like i'm not seeing this or whatever but that was like the depth and the perception that he had mm -hmm. you know like looking at something like that um that was kind of like eye-opening for me that like when you're at that high of a level like it's just ingrained you're not going to see like oh wow you just like feet are flying all over the place or like whatever so that's kind of how i try and apply it like with the lifting and the teaching whatever it is and trying to ingrain and that doesn't come from a week or two weeks that's months and like years of just repetition, learning the process, you know, things along those lines. So I think it does, it does allow, like I said, there's videos, uh, like I've got some, uh, uh, videos now of like, you'll see, like we were doing like a session of like pin, pin, uh, uh, chain pin squats. You know what I mean? Because that's what mm -hmm. I, that's what I wanted to go for from a rate of force development standpoint with, uh, like our football kids or whatever, but they weren't full squatting. They were half, it was like a half squat or whatever, but, um, that's what I wanted for that specific adaptation. But again, like we spent so much time doing our squats and the other stuff and the full range of motion that we were able to work to that and utilize that because it was what was needed. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, of you using methods when they're, when they're appropriate, not just using them just, just because per se. And I'll be honest, there's probably people that think like some of the stuff that I've done is not appropriate, you know, cause they're 16 or 17 years old, which, you know, um, it's fine. Like I said, I, 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 I'm I'm open to criticism, you know, all the time or whatever. But I do also feel pretty confident. That I think things through. Looks you know, like it's working. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, like, right? Like I said, trying to think things through like really well. You know what I mean? So it's not just kind of like random stuff or like whatever. Like, well, I have a thought process behind this, and like some of the ones, like the weight releasers. Um, you know, which mm. I've got, you know, like some sophomores in high school, 16 years old, and people are like, oh, it's too like whatever. I'm like, I've also got videos of them doing freehand front squats two years ago in eighth grade, like literally to like you know going through this last two. So if you've been doing something for two two years now or three years now, like okay, like you can agree or disagree, but like, you know, I thought this method worked pretty good. And you know, I'll be honest, this individual had like a 29 inch vertical and then we go through this and now he's jumping 33, like whatever, like, uh, oh, this one. Yeah. Like right here. Yeah. This movement, these movements are great. The weight releases off the bar as you go into the lowest position of the squat or where, however you set it up, you know, you can do it in bench press and stuff like that too. So like I said, like that one right there, like, I think I, uh, like had some just phenomenal results with it. Like, okay. And like, I try and like, okay, what are the numbers? Like, so if I'm looking at bent, some of our sprint numbers or our, uh, vertical jump numbers, like, okay, if they're not really improving, then this method didn't really do kind of what we wanted, but I'm like, 
okay, I haven't, uh, like, I think the example, um, I had three kids this winter jump over 36 inches, high school, right? <laughs> Two of them were sophomores, one was a junior, right? This, this is on a jump mat. Um, so uh, I never had, like, the highest I had was a 35 before. I think, or whatever, at this at the same school. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, you can like, like whatever, but like, I, I don't, I've been here, what, three or four years, whatever now. I haven't had any 36s. I just had three in this cycle. You know, and yeah. those were kids that were like put three or four inches on over like a, a, a 10, 12 week period. I think people that have never used that, they don't know what to think of it. And I think that uh, they may not realize what a great teaching tool that is to have heavier weight on the eccentric and how much sense it makes. I mean, the eccentric portion of a lift, you're going to be stronger, the lowering portion of the lift. And then as you go to the concentric, the weight comes off. So even for somebody that's not explosive, if 10% uh, of the bar weight comes off at the bottom, you're going to kind of feel explosive. And there's um, kind of like a stretch reflex going on in the body as well, right? Yeah. And like that's, I think the thing is, is, okay, we're doing this for a four week cycle over a 52 week period. You know what I mean? I'm, you're not, I'm not doing this. You're mm -hmm. not doing it every day. You know what I mean? It's like a specific stimulus at this time, and then we you go on to something else or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the other thing too. So like even on this one, like it was a four-week cycle where the first two weeks was like a slow five, six-second eccentric, and then it hits, and then you bounce out. The next one was the ISO. So you'll see like at the top, the goal here is to take that load, get to that halfway mark, and then isometrically hold it, mm -hmm. and then basically just let it drop and free fall. You know what I mean? So like that was, the, that was how it was thought out. That was the goal. That was the four-week basically cycle on it. Then we take them off, and then we're going to other stuff or whatever. So like I said, I thought it was really good. And if you've ever done it before, the amount of just like motor unit recruitment that you're going to get from that of like literally having, you know, 110% with the cha with the hooks on per se, you have 110% of your max on. So you have more than your max on and you're either isometrically holding it or you're slow lowering it. Then like, then like a hundred pounds comes off the bar. It's like, you can't replicate that with any other kind of training method or, or modality. Some people will do it maybe like with a jump or something. They might lower themselves in a jump and let go of the weights as they yeah. jump up or something, but it's kind of funky. Yeah. And so like you get the stimulus of like, oh man, I haven't felt this before. And then I look and like I said, the vertical numbers and the other stuff, I'm like, okay, this worked pretty good. Now would yeah. it work good for someone that doesn't have a squat good? Like every person that's there, they're squatting, you know, really well, you know what I mean? With that. So they're able to do the movements. They need it. We're kind of like, you know, at that point where I want to drive more progress. So I think that's, like I said, that's kind of the, the rationale or the thought process behind it. But Jen, just trying to be, like I said, confident and diligent. And I've done the legwork and thinking through it. So even if it doesn't work or people disagree, okay, that's fine. Like I'm going to be the one that looks in the mirror and say, you know, like I, I think I said on one of them, like I'm either going to come back with my shield or on it. <laughs> so like, okay, you know what? I want a 36, I want a 38, I want a 40 inch vert. Okay. Like you're not, and I know this kind of sounds maybe like over the top, like whatever, but like, I, like the athletes get the one that has to deal, like live with it. And I'm the one as a coach that has to live with it. Okay. We didn't get to 37 or 38. Like it's the person, like whatever that's like, you're not having to deal. Like that's, if you take it somewhat personal as a coach, you're probably going to drive more performance. You know what I mean? It's not like so, probably some motivational quote you're going to read. It's something that you probably just been doing. You know, if you've been in the profession or you just around strength and conditioning, it, ma it should matter to you. You know what I mean? Like, okay, it matter. I can tell you, I can go down the list of my, you know, 60 yard times in baseball. I can go down and tell you, okay, I ran this in at Northern Illinois. I ran a 7.20 in February of 2005. No, it was 2006. I'm sorry. <laughs> but you know what I mean? I ran a 7.2. Then I ran a 6.95 in Rockford, Illinois, uh, about three months later. You know how good that felt? Like, I literally, like, that felt really good. And mm -hmm. then I go to the University of Illinois that summer in 2006 and July of 2000, yeah, July of 2006, and I ran a 7.00 on my first rep. And I was like, I come into that, I'm expecting around six, eight, like maybe six. I'm like, I'd been going through training phenomenal, like training myself, but like, this was really good. I'm feeling faster. And then mm -hmm. I go from a six, nine, five to a seven. I'm like, what? That's, nah, that can't be right. Second rep, I run, I'm like, that was faster. 701. What? Like I just had like three months or two months of great training. How did I just get slower? So like that was to that, what is this? 2000, what was that? 17 years ago? Yeah. Okay. I still, I'm kind of talking like passionate. Like I still, that's still there's emotion tied behind that. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't like that. I was going through that. I was trying my training methods and the other stuff. I took it personal. You know what I mean? So like <laughs> as a coach, yeah. Okay. You know what? Yeah. I'm trying to drive like this stuff matters and it should. And I think if you want to go to like another level as an athlete, whatever it is, get around people, at least in my opinion, I'm obviously biased, like get around people that like it matters and personal and we want to get better. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Power Project family, your normal shoes are making you weak. This is why we partner with Vivo Barefoot Shoes because they have a wide toe box, they're flat, and they're flexible. So with every single step you're taking, if you're taking a 10 minute walk outside or when you're working out in the gym, your feet are able to do what they're supposed to do in this shoe. 
They have tons of options for hiking, running, training in the gym, chilling and relaxing, casual shoes for if you're out on a date. You need to check them out. And Andrew, how can they get it? Yes, that's over at vivobarefoot.com slash power project. And you guys will receive 15% off your order automatically. Again, vivobarefoot.com slash power project. Links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. How do you get some of these athletes, and we were talking about it, like you mentioned the hip 1990s, um, how do you get some of them to buy into the mobility aspect of things? Because that's not as fun for most people as loading some weight onto the bar and lifting some heavy shit, right? So how do you build in that habit to those athletes and help them understand that this is going to be something that's going to help you on the field? It's going to help you long term. Yeah. Um, so I'd say, like, first of all, I think one of the things that I like about this stuff that I do, um, obviously again, biased, uh, but like, okay, when you're doing it, it's like, man, that was really hard. Or like my hip, that was my hips cramping up or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Like, Oh, you can agree, disagree or whatever, but it's like, man, I don't know what you did, but that was, I haven't felt that before. I still right? So there's hips. some level. Mm-hmm. And I think there's some level of like buy-in trust when like, mm-hmm. when I, when I start some of it too, is I, I try and I've thought this through pretty well. So like, if I'm going to start working with there's a reason why we did those movements that mm-hmm. I did with you. All right. I've done those enough to know that like, okay, 99 times out of a hundred, you're going to cramp your hips going to feel really good. They're, you're going to be looking at that like, man, I haven't done that. What does this guy know? Like whatever I'm not, there's some other stuff that might be more appropriate or that would be better for you, mm-hmm. but you, there's a good chance you're not going to do it right. You're not going to feel it. And if you're like, man, this didn't really work. Now I say something, you're like, oh, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. So, you Jedi so, trick him. so, so yeah, like that's what like, and, and I've done this and like, I've done this enough that I know I know how you're going to probably cheat. I know how you're going to like, whatever. Now I come over. I'm like, stop leaning. Nope. Nope. Get the ankle up higher. Nope. Mm-hmm. Nope. Like whatever. And now you're like, dude, I'm trying to get this ankle up. Like, and now I'm kind of yelling at you. Like whatever. You kind of get like, whatever. You're, and, you're, and you're just like, man, like whatever. And it's like, wow, I've never experienced this before. Like, Manipulation. Whatever. Yeah. Like, okay. So now, Hey, we're going to do this. And you're like, okay, man, my hips feeling really good right now. I don't know yeah. what, like, I'm going to listen to that guy. Yeah. You know what I mean? So there's, I'll be honest, there's some of that. So now I can get back to maybe I'm not, maybe I want to do this thing down the line, but I'm not going to start with that. I'm going to start with the stuff, like I said, there to get to that point Mm -hmm. now. So when I get to there, you're like, we didn't even do any spine stuff, but like spine stuff is probably one of the most beneficial stuff that you can do because most people, they can't articulate their spine at all. So I'll put, say like move, I'll put my finger on L3, move, flex and extend L3. And you'll see like T8 through T6, just whatever. I'm like, no, 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 not your threat. I I, I want this spot right here to move. But most people's Mm -hmm. spines are so messed up and they have no, um, basically, um, ability to articulate each individual segment, that that's what you see. The problem is if you start with that, people are going to be like, oh, this is dumb. I'm on my hands. Like, I don't feel anything. Like, well, oh, this is stupid. Like, whatever. I'm like, yeah, because you're not doing it right. Like, but the problem is if I have 40 people, I can't coach each individual person. Yeah. So if I start with something where everyone's kind of looking around like, this is dumb, this is stupid, even though it might be the most beneficial thing for you, I'm not going to get what I want done next because I have no trust or no buy-in. But if I do this and this, and you're like, dude, this is awesome. Hey, now everybody bring it up. Look, stop. Pay attention. This is super important. All right, listen. Right here. Do you see how he's moving up his spine? I need you to stop. Watch this. All right. You got to boom, boom. I talk, whatever. Now everyone's like, okay, okay, let's lock in. Let's go do you like whatever. I built that up because of the other stuff that I did, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So like, that's how I try and go about it. And then trying to explain to and like to educate, like I said, okay, you probably want to lift. What's, what's, mo- you want to get bigger. You want to get stronger. You want to get better at your sport or whatever. Okay. Well, one of the first one, this is a perfect, this is an example I used, um, when I was, uh, uh, Texas tech of like, okay, who wants to, uh, who wants to play in the NFL? Everyone's hands go up, right? What do you need to play in the NFL? And it's size, you know, guys, size, strength, speed, like whatever. I'm like, okay, you know what you need? You need tape. So you need actual like game tape. Like you can't just have like great combine numbers, but you never have like game tape on the field. Yeah. And you need numbers. So like, okay, if you go for 80 catches for a 1100 yards and like whatever 17 tds or whatever okay you got tape and you got numbers now okay size strength whatever but like that's what the scouts are looking at first they're looking at the tape and you're not what's your production you know what i mean how do you get tape and how do you get numbers you have to actually be on the field Mm. so like if you're not healthy and you can't play you can't get tape you can't get numbers so if i go a whole four-year career in college and i played six games my freshman year eight games my sophomore year, three games my junior year, and four games my senior year. How many game, How many opportunities did I have to accumulate tape? And how many games did I have to accumulate numbers? Not a whole lot, because mm-hmm. I admit, like, whatever. But if I can go, I played nine games my freshman year, 12 games my sophomore year, 10 games my junior year, 11 games my senior year, just based on the n- law of numbers, you're going to have more tape, you're going to have more numbers, you're going to have a better opportunity to get drafted, go higher, and make more money. 
Okay, so now I'm probably talking the language that you want to hear. So when we're doing this this mobility stuff, like I was showing, like, and, and I'll pull people down. All right, if your hip can't move, and now I yank on it, do you know where all that tension and all that force goes? Right in your knee. Mm-hmm. If your hip can't internally rotate, it's going into your your knee, your MCL. Now if I tibia, now if I rotate your tibia, now it's ACL. So if this hip can't move, but it needs to go here, it's either going to compensate or your knee's done. All right. You, so that's trying how that's how I try and. Uh, get that buy and like understand like this is important and kind of like to, to just being honest, like, dude, I'll be honest. I would rather, I like lifting weights. Like I, I personally, I like the speed, the power, as you can see the other stuff, mm-hmm. but if you're not healthy and you're only at 80 or 90% or this, this nagging injury, we can't do that stuff. Yeah. So we gotta be, it's like an insurance policy. We've gotta be doing this stuff to make sure you're healthy to be, so you can train so you can play. So like, we've got to do this stuff. And like I was saying, if it's stupid, we're not going to do it. And I've said that before, like, I'll be honest, if I look at it and there's been a lot of times where I've like, man, this is a good idea. I like this Boom, thought out. Then we go on it. I'm like, oh, this is dumb. This is, this is not working how I thought it. And I'll, I'll bring, I'll tell the kids like, Hey, that's, this was dumb. We're not doing this again. Like, I'll be honest. I'm stupid. Like, well, okay, we're fine. And I'm, so I'm not, I'm not scared to say that was a bad idea on myself or whatever. Yeah. I think honestly, if you've ever been in situations, the worst, like one of the things that's like horrible is like when you get someone that's like, everybody knows it's a bad idea. This isn't working, but they keep trying to play it around. Like it's going great. Like we're doing a good job. Like, no, it's not, this isn't working. Mm-hmm. Like the but you uh, get- coach that won't let go of his play. Yeah. It's like coach, the play fucking sucks. The whole team hates this play. And every time we run it, everyone knows that we're going to get smashed when we run it, but you still continue to run mm-hmm. the same play. Exactly. So when you <laughs> show, it sounds like weakness, yeah. but when you admit that, it gets more buy-in and trust from everybody else. Because when you can admit, like, and and there's books that talk about this, when you can admit your shortcomings as, like, a leader or, like, whatever, people, that resonates with people. You know what I mean? Now, you have to have a certain level. Like, if you come in as a first year, like, whatever, and you're like, oh, that didn't work good or whatever, you don't have that, like, experience or that kind of, like, I guess, resume, if you will. But once you develop that and then you admit your mistakes and other stuff, it helps in the whole process. So, like, I'll tell, um, we were doing, so actually, like, in that, uh, the, we were doing a pin squat uh, just like recently. So like with my older football players, like our varsity guys, we were doing pin uh, pin back squats like a 90 degree, um, you know, on our day two or our second lower body day. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was doing the same thing with the freshmen, but the freshmen, um, the varsity guys had done variations before. This was the first time with the freshmen. And I'll be honest, it just wasn't – the freshmen – they didn't have the pin set right. I was trying to help them with that. They didn't have them too low on some of them. And it just was like – it just wasn't working good. And I was like, okay, you know what, like – in my head, I'm trying to correct. I'm like, okay, you know what? We're just, these guys are just going to go to, we're going to do pause squats for the next, we're just going to, whatever. And so I told them like, at the end, I'm like, Hey guys, stop turning music off. All right, listen up. Right. I'll be honest. This, this is on me. This isn't going good. You guys are doing good. You guys are working hard. You guys are doing everything you want, but trust me, we're not going to do the pin squats. We're just go regular back to regular pause back squats or whatever. So we'll finish up. we got two more sets. We're going to finish up, do the best you can, but we'll be done with this. Don't worry about that. Okay. Okay. I have no, I have no problem admitting like I'm, what I'm seeing isn't working. It's good. I don't care if you're 15 or you're 60 years old. I'll admit when I'm wrong or I'll try and do, you know what I mean? It's cause that's hard to do. It's hard to admit when you're wrong or this isn't going. But like I said, I try and be as open, like just try and be as honest with I can. Mm-hmm. Um, at least from my perspective, I'm probably biased on that. But I think that's one of the things that really helps too, like from the mobility and the other, st- the other, the other stuff of just trying to, um, you know, explain kind of the, the long-term big picture on why it's so important, why we need to do it. How do you get people faster in the weight room? Cause I think sometimes coaches will say you can't teach speed. Yeah. Um, so I think, so when you look at the weight room, I would kind of combine it like uh, just strength conditioning in general. So like I think one of the biggest things is is looking at like the overview of, of, of your kind of training process in general. So one of the biggest issues that I think or one of the common problems that people have with speed is like when you look at rest periods, like quality, if you want to get faster, you need to have quality reps. That's like really, really important, right? So one of the things that a lot of people do, and I see this even when I coach people like remotely or, or, or help people, is the rest periods are way too short. So I use uh, like sprint timing systems, which are really, really nice because it's like, okay, you run. Here's your, you ran a 102 on this flying 10. You are supposed to have three minutes of rest but you cut somebody in line and you went before I told you or whatever, and you only had 60 seconds of rest. And now you ran a one Oh nine. I got slower. No, you're tired. You're fatigued. Like you might feel like you're fresh, but you need a general rule. And I, and I apologize, whoever um, this came from, um, it's not mine. And I just use it for every 10 yards you sprint. You should have about 10 seconds of rest. So if I sprint 30 yards, a 30 yard sprint max effort, I should have three minutes of rest before I go again. Mm-hmm. right? Most people will go like 40, 50, 60 seconds of rest. And if you actually had like GPS data or whatever, you would see like, okay, the first rep was good. Then the second, third, and fourth rep were just, they weren't very, they weren't fast enough to elicit the adaptation you need to run fast. So mm-hmm. I would say, I would start there of like, okay, you know what? It's not about doing more. It's about doing higher quality work. Right. The second thing is, uh, when you look at, um, so I'll go with, there's 
basically two, two kind of components, I would say, from a speed standpoint, acceleration and max velocity, all right? Acceleration, there's three key components, and this is not mine. This is from, I believe it's uh, Jonas Dedu. He's a really good coach. Uh, I've taken his course. Um, he's out in the UK, does a phenomenal job, right? From an acceleration standpoint, there's three things. It's how well you project, so how well your hip projects, all right? Um, your ability to switch your limbs, and then how stiff you are in contact or your reactivity, right? So what you're looking at from acceleration is basically how well can you project your hip and the orientation of it. So to be able to project your hip, you need to produce a good amount of power. So I need to literally see the hip move and I need to see at the angle. If the angle is too vertical, right, I'm not projecting out. And if it's too low, I'm not going to set myself up for a good second and third step, right? The second thing is how well you can switch. So basically how fast I can get, once I extend, how fast can I switch into my next step, right? If I can't switch very fast, it's going to take longer and I'm not going to have enough force coming into the ground to be able to basically recycle that energy, which comes to the third point of the reactivity. So when that foot, kind of like we were doing with the pogo hops, how stiff can I be on contact? If I can take that elastic energy, like this example right here, and I can bounce straight up, or if I have to hit and then go slow, I'm losing elastic energy. So when I look at acceleration, those are the three things that I look at. So like, what are the drills that we can do? So we'll do stuff like the broad jumps, resisted broad jumps, um, you know, stuff like that, switching drills, and then just running accelerations fast and then making sure that we're rested. We'll do resistance sprints and other stuff. When you look at max velocity, you're looking at basically, um, you know, probably for most people, 30 yards plus, you know, faster athletes are still like accelerating past that point. But generally you're looking probably 30 to 50 yards on that. And at that point, you're looking at how fast and how stiff can my ground contact times basically be. So we'll do stuff like the pogo hops are a great example. Um, we'll do wicket runs because I think that's one of the things like most people are really, really bad technique wise. And I've, and I've, and I've talked about this. You don't have to be a world-class sprinter in my opinion, from an athletic standpoint, but most people's sprint mechanics are so bad mm. that even if you just go from bad to average, that's like really what you need, but you'll see positions and it kind of comes back to physics. If you're running and when you strike your, your foot is in front of your center of mass, you're literally hitting the brakes. Your body has to hit the brakes to stop for your center of mass to catch up. And then you can go again. Mm. So if I'm trying to go as fast as I can, do I want to be hitting the brakes while I'm running? Nope. No. And that's a common thing is that you'll see the foot strike in front of the center mass. You'll see a very long like backswing. So the, like, as soon as my foot leaves, I want it to come through and I want to come down. If you see this long, like elongated, like backswing back here, it's taking you so long to get into your next stride. It's also just wasting a lot of energy and you're not going to be in the right positions to be able to transmit or, or, or utilize elastic energy in a, in a, in a way that's going to allow you to run fast. So utilizing drills to try and kind of correct that fix that. And like I said, um, so like those are the two things and then just running fast. So like if you're running 30, 40 yards or whatever, getting two to three reps on that or whatever, whatever your kind of program says, but that's probably the biggest thing. And then from the weight room, being able to produce more force. I think that's probably the biggest thing in the weight room is being able to produce force. So like if you're trying to run fast and, um, there's different squat standards, but like, okay, if you're a college you know, football player mm -hmm. and your best front squats, 185 pounds, you're probably not producing like very much, like unless there's something that I'm not seeing or whatever. All right. Uh, now you don't have to squat, you know, five or 600 pounds per se to do that, but there's a certain level of strength to be able to produce the force to be able to run, uh, especially from an acceleration standpoint or to be able to jump or, or things like that. So like, that's one of the biggest things in the weight room is being able to generate more force. And then there are other stuff like, I, like I like, uh, utilizing like, uh, eccentric, eccentric means. So like, uh, you know, focusing on rapid eccentrics, different variations where the load is maybe isn't as high, but the goal is to basically go down as fast as you can, you know? So you're probably talking more like 70 ish percent bar weight in that where you're trying to basically rapidly snap down and explode up. You're talking about a squat, right? Yeah. Squat or like a Bulgarian, a Bulgarian split squat. I'll do rapids on like jumps too. So like mm -hmm. the, a rapid eccentric on the jump, um, uh, on that. And then utilizing, I like utilizing once we get kind of advanced, it kind of comes back to, uh, developing, you know, a level of competency in what you're doing of utilizing a co I think accommodating resistance is really good, you know, as well. And I wouldn't, like I said, start off with that and whatever, but I think from an athleticism standpoint and a speed standpoint, there's a lot of benefits to, uh, when the time's right, incorporating chains, um, you know, bands to a certain degree and then utilizing different, like, you know, ISOs, uh, different stuff like we said with the weight releasers. Just to interrupt like for a second, but like a weight releaser, a, a band, especially there's other ways to go about doing this. I guess a plyometric, you are um, you're getting a kinetic energy into the body because you're dropping the weight much faster than you normally could uh, with a band with the weight being on there. And let's just say it's 300 pounds at the top of the exercise. Uh, it might be 200 pounds at the bottom of the exercise, but you can like go down so quick that your body still thinks that amount of weight is on there. And then you're going to push with more force is kind of some yep. of the idea and concept. And then when, when you're running or doing a plyometric, jumping down from something and jumping up on something else, uh, kind of same principle, right? Like if you, if you jam into the ground as hard as possible when you're running, 
some people might think like, shit, you're going to hurt yourself. Well, you would hurt yourself probably if your tissues weren't prepared for it. So you could hurt yourself, but, uh, that is going to be the way that you're probably going to run the most efficiently because you're going to take advantage of stored energy in the body. Absolutely. And like, that's one of the kind of, we were talking about earlier too, of, uh, there's a, a huge elastic component of running. So, um, an acceleration, like being strong and, and, and musk it, it's, it's, I don't want to, say it can across, be to your detriment I, I, yeah, in some yeah. cases yeah early in acceleration that's why you kind of see some studies about like olympic lifters like being able to stay up you know 10 20 meters or whatever because you're producing a bunch of force like which is an acceleration as you get to top end velocities you can get and like this is um you know relatively i wouldn't i don't know common or whatever but you'll see some people where it's like man they're not super strong but they're so elastic they can transfer like you t you look at some like triple jumpers is a great example because that's mm -hmm. triple jumpers um i believe from the russian literature is like Triple jumping is the highest correlated exercise to like the hundred meter sprint. So like basically, if you look at like being a really good triple jumper, yeah, you're having a you're utilizing a ton of that's all elastic energy. And you look at a lot of them, they're kind of longer, leaner, not super like muscular per se, but their tendons are so stiff. And when you look at like being able to be successful in the hundred meters, once you get past thirty or forty meters, it's how elastic basically can you run, you know, with relatively good technique and other factors or whatever. So like that's one of the biggest things of of uh, when you're looking at like the plyometrics and the other stuff of teaching the body how to utilize elastic energy, how to have stiff contacts, how to be firm, and kind of like to that point of of using. And again, this isn't my example, um, and I apologize. I like, to, I like to give credit to the people where I get it from, and I can't whatever. But someone had a really good example of I think it was Ken Clark, um, who's a sprint researcher, about like your hip, uh, like like hitting a nail so like when you get to like your a position or whatever if you just come down and barely hit the nail or you come down and strike it that's kind of what you want your hip to do like mm -hmm. when you're sprinting like you have to be aggressive and you have to be violent and that's how you produce that high uh spiking ground contact now the, the other thing is how well you can handle that yeah. so like if you're if you're if you're not stiff and you're not able to handle that first of all your body's probably not gonna produce it because it knows it can't it can't it, it's gonna be a waste or you're gonna slow yourself down but like that's why you want to use like the plyometrics, the isometrics, um, you know, other stuff to to create more tendon basically stiffness to be able to handle those higher levels of forces. You know what I mean? And you look at like what the amount of force is coming down. Like if you're running 24, 25 miles an hour mm -hmm. or whatever it is, like you know, from a, there's a ton of on the lower leg forces coming down on that that um, you know that are required to be able to run it. I want to say it's like speed. a thousand pounds from uh, Hussein Bolt. Yeah, I mean it's it's absolutely like a ridiculous number. And like I said, those are specific adaptations that are going to come from uh be running at those type of velocities if you will yeah so obviously running at those velocities you mentioned plyometric and isometrics and like we've had different people come on the podcast and talk about um increasing tendon strength but what do you do with athletes to specifically work on that so i'll do um so plyometrics but then i i've started using like a lot of isometrics and i'll be honest um probably even just the last like three ish weeks um, there's a really good, uh, you know, course that I just took. It's from Alex Natera. It's a uh, sprint specific isometrics, mm -hmm. uh, not, not, uh, getting any, you know, money for endorsements or whatever. But, um, so even just like the last three weeks and this kind of goes back to, again, like I'm always trying to learn and like advance and like improve what I'm doing. So like I'm doing some stuff right now, like with that stuff, like there's different sprint positions and the ISOs and we're doing some different tests. I've done different tests on like force plates, looking at like how much force are we producing, you know, with the ankle, the, the, the hip, um, you know, different joint positions with that, they're kind of correlated to sprinting. So doing, utilizing different stuff, like, so uh, like right now we might be doing like say an ankle ISO push, right? And then we're doing our, we're doing, everyone's going through that. Then we're doing our back squats. You know what I mean? So doing basically um, these different angles against whether it's, you know, sometimes it's max ISO. So you're pushing against a movable object for mm -hmm. like, say maybe five, seven seconds. And you're trying to literally, if I've got like a bar on a squat rack and I'm at the right angle, I've got it set up to where like, there's so much weight in the bar that you can't move it. But your goal is to lift, you know, 600 pounds off that position. Cause if yeah. you can, then you're producing the, the amount of force you're producing. So that's one of the ways that um, I'm kind of going about doing that. A lot of the ISOs, the plyometrics, um, you know, and then incorporating stuff, like I said, uh, like uh, with the lifting stuff as well. Um, I think that's kind of my kind of, uh, process right now for that and, mm -hmm. and again like i could be doing like these sprint these isos and it's like oh this doesn't work very well okay like we'll go you know maybe you know it's kind of a waste you know times times like one of your most important things in training so you can only delineate so much of it or you only have so much of it available not even just from a programming standpoint but from a recovery standpoint like mm. i can't do three hours of plyometrics like yeah. i just can't so if something's not beneficial kind of wait at opportunity cost we're wasting our time doing it so trying to figure out like oh wow like i said the weight releases was a really good example like man that worked really good Mm -hmm. I'm probably going to be using that and other very, like, I'm going to try and figure out different ways to use that because I saw good results from it. All right. Some of these eyes like, man, this, like, this worked really well. Um, you know, we're going to keep trying to drive it up and drive those numbers high. I had a kid, um, a freshman 
that I uh, kind of can go back to some of these videos. I got to, I got to make the, I got to put this one up cause it's a good one. Um, but it was like one of the ISOs, like the, the spring ankle from Cal Dietz and like people like, Oh, this doesn't get you faster. Just sprint. And I was like, Oh, wow. <laughs> never thought about that. Thanks. Like <laughs> never thought about sprinting to get faster, man. Like appreciate it or whatever, or like plat or like whatever. But I've got the video of him like doing it. He's struggling like big time. And I think mm-hmm. his best fly in 10, like a year ago was like a one Oh two one Oh one. He just ran and he's had like a nine, six, like in the fall or whatever, but he just ran like a 0.93, like a month ago, which is like, I think that's close to like 20, getting close to like 22 miles an hour. Um, which wow. is like as a freshman, like that's, that that's the third fastest time I've, I've had. Mm-hmm. or whatever that's you're you're moving that is fast or yeah. whatever but i've got the, like the people are like oh this doesn't work like whatever and i'm like well i mean he just ran there's other stuff that he's doing or we're doing or whatever but it's like okay the numbers they are what they are he's dropped over a tenth on his flying 10 to go from like 20 miles an hour to close to 22 miles an hour and he's still 15 years old or mm. whatever so like that's kind of one of the ways okay this isn't working our numbers aren't improving yeah then we won't do it or whatever but like the isos like i said i've, I've seen really good results with them um in conjunction with the vertical jump and the other stuff so uh, that's how i'm kind of incorporating it and i think the challenge then becomes two of like, how do you incorporate or where do you incorporate that stuff? You know what I mean? So like, there's some stuff like people, like people will ask for like a general answer on stuff. Like, uh, you know, like when you're doing say this exercise, where do you put it at? I'm like, okay, how many times is team training a week? Like, where are they at in their, their, their training program? Uh, are they in season, out of season, wherever it is, how many athletes do I have? How much time do we have? Cause they're all going to affect what you do. Like you have to know, like, what are your parameters? And then I can go put that stuff in. So like yeah. how I was saying like the ankle pushes and the hip pushes, like we're doing it. And the reason why we do it is because the bars, like if you have a lot of people and you have to feel okay, say you say you do back squat and then bench press, all right? It takes, when you have a lot of kids, it takes a while to go from the bench press or the squat down to the bench press. So if you only have like say 35, maybe 40 minutes and it's taking an extra of three to five minutes to transition from back squat to, to bench press per se, mm-hmm. that's a good percentage of your time. So like I have that stuff set up. So it's like, we're doing the that push off the, the racks, but we're going right into back squat. So there's not a whole lot of, transition time that we have to move you might have to take you're gonna have to take the weights off but we're already set you know what i mean on wednesday we do bench press and a hip iso push right so bench the hip iso push we don't need anything at the rack we can do it somewhere else so that's why i have the hip iso push on that day it's because we can bench we can't bench press and do with the ankle push because you can't be in the same spot so like when people ask those questions it's like well i've got to have all the details set up and then i can figure it out kind of like a puzzle piece from there so like there's some stuff that we do at the end of the workout because okay we just don't have time to do it or like if we don't have time to get it done I need to get this other stuff done. That's more higher priority. I don't know if we'll have all time to get everything done. So if we don't get it done, it is what it is. You know what I mean? So like, that's kind of, that's kind of how I go about it. And I think that's the challenge of like, just trying to figure out your own program. I think one of the struggles that people do have is they try and take somebody else's program or ideas and then put it into, you know what I mean? It doesn't fit like, like there might be great ideas, you know what I mean? Um, But if it doesn't fit congruently into what you're trying to do with a program you're running, then it's not going to like work good. You know what I mean? Like, like the cake, like there's a good like cake example. Like, okay, you know what? Like if you get, Actually, that maybe it's not a good example. I don't know. Your bacon. <laughs> Think about your bacon. I don't know. Like, okay, chocolate chips is good. And you know what? Uh, pepperoni tastes good on my pizza. Yeah. Those are two good ingredients. But if I put them together, you know what? It's probably not going to, whatever I'm making, it's probably not going to taste very good. You know what I mean? And we so don't I, know if we, I don't, unless we yeah, try. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Salty, we go. sweet, spicy yeah. a little bit. That sounds yeah. like, that sounds like, were you at Westside when JM was there? <laughs> yeah. That sounds like one mm-hmm. of JM's, actually speaking of that, Alex, I was going to ask you, uh, about some of those stories about like, like the, uh, what was it like the candy? Like, you know what I mean? Like in the pockets where you like, oh, let it, yeah. you like let it melt or you like, you drink the chocolate <laughs> syrup cause it's easier to get more calories down. Oh my I'll God. see all kinds of stuff there. I mean, you'd see McDonald's, you know, guys walking in with like McDonald's bags and stuff. But one guy, um, named Tilt, he was 450 pounds <laughs> and he's like doing, uh, he's doing like lap pull downs. And then like, I, I'm trying to like, you know, sneak in like a set, but then he just turns around and then sits on the lap pull down machine. And I'm like, I'll just wait, you know? And then I see like a Snickers bar fall out of his pocket. <laughs> <laughs> and then he like does his set. And then he's like sitting there, on, he's sitting there on the lap pull down, like <laughs> eating a Snickers bar. I'm like, only, only in this place. Well, why did you guys call him tilt? That's about to uh, he, yeah, he was born, uh, it was something a little bit off. And so he kind of walked to the, so this guy had some scoliosis shit and y'all like, oh, tilt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's, make, let's make fun of him. <laughs> God, yeah, I wasn't about to make fun of him. He was fucking big. But he was one of the more talented people there. I mean, he, I think he did a good morning with like a thousand pounds. Oh, my wow. Yeah, it was wild. Power Project family, quality sleep can make everything with your health and fitness easier, which is why we've partnered with Hostage Tape. Now, we've been talking about mouth tape for years and nasal breathing for years. But one of the problems that we've had with tape is we all like to rock facial hair. And a lot of the mouth tapes we would use would fall off of our face at night. Hostage Tape doesn't fall off your face if you have a beard 
or if you're not a man and you don't, I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> you, you don't need a beard, right? But either way, hostage tape makes sense. It'll stick to your face when you're asleep. You'll have better quality sleep because you're breathing through your nose all night long. It is a no brainer. And if you head to hostagetape.com slash power project, you'll be able to get the power project annual deal, which is a year's supply of hostage shape for 55 cents a day. You'll be saving $150 on the typical yearly deal. You're going to get two free tins and a blindfold. It's a no brainer. So head there right now and get yourself some hostage tape. Links in the description along with the podcast show notes. Shut your f-ing mouth when you sleep. Enjoy the show. Jesus. Strong as shit. Yeah. yeah, it's great. It's actually, it's funny. It's funny because. Have uh, you ever been there? I haven't. Uh, it was funny because I, part of, part of, I think what helps too is just kind of have general conversations, you know, like with the people that you work with, clients or whatever, like, okay, we can relate. We can talk about this or whatever. And so like, there's this like gym. It's actually a really good, they had a really good business idea. Cause they basically made this. So like my, the, the high school that I work at, it's like 2,500 kids, but then there's two junior highs mm-hmm. that are relatively close. It's a busy. So like the gym is, be, this gym has become like the cool kids go there and work out or whatever. And it's like 10 bucks a month or whatever. Um, so it's like, it's always packed. Apparently like f- three to seven, it's all high school kids, junior high. Like there's nothing, you can't do mm. anything or whatever. Wow. And so like, uh, like one of these kids, <laughs> freshman, great kid or whatever, but he was like, cause there's only like four squat racks or whatever. And I was like, oh, how's it been going at this, at this gym uh, place or whatever? He's like, oh, it's good. It's hard to get a squat rack though. And then there's like this one power lifter. <laughs> He's always coming in and then he takes it. He's always breathing heavy too. And he, he takes like eight minutes between each set <laughs> and he's at the squat, like he'll be at the squat rack for three hours. And so he just hogs <laughs> it to himself or whatever. And I'm just, and I, I thought you would appreciate that story or whatever. Cause I'm like, Oh man, like the, 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 the fight for some of these kids, like, I'll be honest, like, so I asking like one of them, like, yeah, I had to wait two hours for the squat rack. I'm like, dude, that's when you go at a different time or you figure mm, another right. gym to go out. Like, dude, if you're, I'll give you credit. If you're waiting two hours to get to the squat rack, like Patience. you deserve it. C- congrats, respect. I just do a different exercise. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, okay, we're moving on, or I'm coming back at like eight o'clock tonight, or like whatever. Um, but no, yeah, it's funny hearing some of those. Like we all like we're at that age, you know what I mean? We're going through the gym stories. You mm-hmm. see the guys yeah, or whatever. Yeah. You remember that? Uh, actually, I remember their their age. The supplements. Uh, you remember the supplement called Gakic? I, I remember hearing. Okay, about it, yeah. so like I actually have a very mm-hmm. so basically, and this is kind of this is like my junior year of high school. So like Gakic. Had yeah. this claim that it would improve strength by like ten point, it was like ten point seven percent. I want to say it was something like that where it wasn't like it it wasn't like ten. It wasn't five. It was like man, this seems like this wow. is like a like an interesting like whatever. I'm like it was like sixty bucks. I'm like which like dude, when you're in high school like mm-hmm. fifteen years ago or like whatever. I'm like man, that's expensive or whatever. I'm like I need this supplement or whatever. And I remember at that time it was super easy because I remember my bench press was two hundred pounds. So I was like the ten percent. I was like okay, I, I, if I take this supplement, I'm gonna bench two twenty. All right. So like I go to GNC <laughs> and I'm like asking like, so wait, is this like, it's guaranteed to give me a 10% increase. And the guy's like, oh yeah. Like, you know, like whatever. I'm like, so I bench press 200 right now. Yep. There it is. <laughs> I bench press 200 right now. I'm going to bench press 220 pounds after taking. He's like, well, it might be like the second or third time, but yeah, <laughs> he's like, whatever. I'm like, and he's like, there's a full re I'm like, there, I think I might ask he's like full refunds. If I don't do it, I get all my money back. He's like, oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> I'm like, okay, good. Awesome. I take it. All right. And I take it for like a week and I'm like, dude, this stuff's so, like, I, I think I actually did hit a five pound PR. Mm-hmm. So I think I got to two or five, but it wasn't two twenty Like it said, I'm like, dude, this is B- like, whatever. So I go back with the open bottle of Gakic to that store. And I'm like, I want my money back. And I remember the guy looking at me like, wait, what? I thought you were just going to, I didn't think I was ever going to see you again. Like whatever. And I didn't know at the time that GNC, they got their, like, uh, you got your, uh, what is it? Commission mm. for your sales. So like mm-hmm. the guy made money mm. from selling that to me. And I'm like, yeah, I want my money back. And he's like, Oh, uh, <laughs> like couldn't believe it. So like that was my story because I remember like vividly I should be benching 220 right now. This supplement <laughs> didn't work. And actually the, the funny thing about that too is I remember you couldn't go because like there was only like a Walmart like where I lived. Mm-hmm. The only shaker bottle, like now shaker bottles are everywhere. Like it was like a Rubbermaid like this, I think I still have it in my parents' house, but it's like this weird rubber made. That was the only shaker bottle you could get at stores like 15, 16 years ago. You know what yeah. I mean? Now you see like the, the regular mm-hmm. shakers everywhere. So I like, that's kind of one of the things that um, I just remember in my head. Like the first shaker bottle I ever got was to get the Gakic. And honestly, in my head, I was like, man, I don't, you know what? I think there's too much of the powder sticking to the side because it was kind of rubber when you would shake it. I'm like, I need one of these like glass. 
You know, like mixing drinks. Maybe that's where, why you didn't get that like, extra was, no, little yeah, weight yeah. on the bench. No, yeah, that's why I was like, man, I, I just need a different shaker bottle. Like, I'm, I'm trying to like run through. Like, there's no way this has to work or whatever. <laughs> and the one you used was a powder, yeah. Yeah, it was powder. Okay. <laughs> they, they had pills. They had pills and the powder. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Sound, sounds. There's a good sound Dude, right there. Dude, there's 300 milligrams of caffeine in mm-hmm. the Gakic pills. It says that it increases an, uh muscle performance by an average of 21. percent Okay, it's gone up there. It went up there. It went up. Okay, it went up. It went up because it wasn't that. It wasn't that high. But I remember it was like 10 or whatever. But anyway, and it's actually interesting. Interesting now when you look at supplements of like we were talking about BPAC and like the focus and whatever. And I remember back like when I was, you know, you know, the kids age that I train now, and you would look at like, okay, what do I want to buy? Like whatever. And it was like, mm-hmm. okay, the good buzzwords are like that's that's where you're gonna get my money. All right. Hey, like, you know, pump, increase pump by 10.6%. Mm-hmm. The vascularity <laughs> or you know, arterial blood flow, like get str- like whatever. I'm like, okay, this is what I'm reading. If I read anything that was like Improve focus. Improve. Okay, no, no, I don't want that. No, 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 no. Not get my money. Now when I look back, though, when you look at it like from a training session, when you go in, if your mind's just everywhere else, whether it's business, like whatever, how yeah. good of training sessions do you normally have? Ugh. But when you're able to just completely lock in oh, yeah. and you're just like completely there. And so like that was like a really – and it kind of comes coming back full circle like a training standpoint. Mm-hmm. If you're not focused or like completely kind of immersed into what you're doing – you're not going to be able to get the results that you probably could or that you'll need to at some point because you get to a point where you're okay, you make progress in the beginning, but now you got to actually like, you know, work harder, that focus, the other stuff. So like that's kind of like from the, the mobility, the other stuff, that focus is such a key component of the training process. And I've kind of like, like I said, BPAC, you know, talks about a lot, the mind muscle connection, like that level from a bodybuilding standpoint. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of like a light bulb for me from a coaching standpoint with a lot of the other stuff that I do. But it was just funny going back to the supplements about like, man, yeah, I don't need focus. Like, no, that's not like whatever. Kind of like the buzzwords. And now trying to, so it helps me to honestly think about what's going through kids' heads when you're trying to like relate to stuff and like, okay, what what was I thinking at that age? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it's like, I, I still fight this battle of like, kids will go to the gym, like, and they'll max on bench four days a week. Mm-hmm. Like, like whatever. And it's like, no, stop. We have this whole six week cycle set up to bench, have your heaviest day here. And you just did it two days ago. Like, mm-hmm. at your, like, don't stop doing that or whatever. But part of it is like, I go back because I remember, like, I had, I fought like hell to go from 200 to 205. I was benching four days a week. Mm-hmm. Every day was a max out day. <laughs> like, I got it. You got it. You got it. You got to hit your, you gotta, it's, it's coming at some point. And then you don't stop. You, you don't step back to like, oh man, you know what? I probably should have done fives or seven or something like whatever but like it helps you relate or it helps me relate to those situations you know what i mean because okay this is what this is what their head's going through so yeah. when you're trying to talk long term and the other stuff of trying to like come at it from that angle or like whatever or like i said like the the examples like the split squats mm. okay like i'll use myself like okay how bad oh man your ankle your knee's not going forward coach your back knee's really bad like yeah this isn't very good i'm like exactly mm-hmm. so if you don't do this right now this is probably what you're going to look like when you're my age, you know what I mean? So like, if you keep doing just what you're doing, keep doing like the cause, like the split squats and you keep working on this, you're going to look so much better and everything's going to be so much better. You're not going to have some back problems probably or hip or knee or whatever it is or whatever. So like, that's how I try to use like myself in those examples yeah. to help kind of look long-term on that. Cool. What you got over there, Andrew? I'm just curious. I remember when I was a kid, everyone said lift kids lifting, it'll stunt your growth <laughs> or whatever. Where the heck did that even come from? Uh, that's a really good question. Yeah, um, I'm just, I, I know it not, I, it's false, but like, I'm just curious because like, I heard that so many times. Yeah, I mean, I think, honestly, I think some stuff just gets, keeps getting passed down, kind of like the knees over the toes stuff. Uh-huh. I think some stuff just get, gets started, just keeps getting passed down, but no one stops to like critically think or like, why are we doing this? Or why do, like, why do we keep doing the same thing over and over? Mm-hmm. Like, what's the quote, like the most dangerous thing or in a bit or whatever is like, we've always done it this way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. And it's, so I think some of that, I, I don't, I don't know the history to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but I think I, I would imagine it's probably something like that where it just got repeated by somebody, maybe like a, a doctor or somebody else. It was, you know, probably relatively credible and mm-hmm. it just got kept getting repeated and repeated and repeated over and over again. And so like kind of to that point of like, uh, like the, the knees over the toes, because I like using this example a lot. It's like one of my go-tos of like, mm-hmm. like my, my doctor said your knee shouldn't go over your toes or my mom said like your knee shouldn't go or like whatever it is. And I was like, okay, like your knee going over your toe is basically your, you, you, you have to be able to dorsiflex your ankle. That's a byproduct of your ankle dorsiflexing. All right, so if your ankle can't dorsiflex, your knee can't go over your toe. So like if I told you, you can't raise your hand above your shoulder, would you say, what would you say? And you're like, oh, that's stupid. So like if you could only go to right here, what would you like, whatever, like, no, I should be able to do this. I'm like, well, how is that any different? 
Like, mm-hmm. how is it your shoulder only going to right here different than your ankle stopping as soon as your knee starts getting past your toe? It's the same. It's a shoulder, your hip, your ankle, like whatever. You, I would say that and you'd be like, you're an idiot. I'm like, but that's the same concept of what, what you're talking about right now. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And then like people are like, oh, I didn't think about that. Like, whatever. I'm like, okay, well, if you just keep repeating the same thing over and over, and I think that's where like the critical thinking aspect comes in of, okay, well, why are we saying this? Or why are we doing this? Or like, why shouldn't kids lift? And I think like, as I talked over there, if you're good, I would, I'll, I'll, and I'll tell people this. I don't, I, I think lifting and training for kids is phenomenal. I think bad lifting for kids is really bad mm-hmm. and I wouldn't have kids do that. All right. So if, if it's going to be like, Hey, should my 12 year old train? I think that'd be really good. If my 12 year old is going to go to the gym and just rounded back deadlift, <laughs> do a bunch of stuff. I would say they are better off waiting to, to, if they, even if they wait three years, so they get to high school, but they can work with someone that's good. That's going to teach them. Yeah. That's a lot better. I would say right now, that's a lot better, but those are two different contexts. You know what I mean? That's hard to, you can't, it's hard to give general answers on that. And, and that's what I think a lot of times too, I think it's better to be more conservative training kids with that in mind. You know what I mean? Like, okay, you don't need to be doing, I don't care what your max bench press is for the most part, you know, at 13 years old or whatever, or like some of this other stuff, because yes, I do think it's important, but like the reality of, of like, what am I probably going to see if I tell that to 30 kids, you're going to see a bunch of, you know, just bad lists, squats, whatever it is. So I think trying to be like realistic about where people are at, where kids are at. Mm -hmm. And then, like I said, if you start with body weight stuff, most people are so bad with body weight stuff and it's so challenging. You can stick with that for a long time. Then you start doing like longer eccentrics, longer pauses, you know, different ways to like kind of uh, utilize just the body weight. I mm-hmm. think you can make a ton, a ton of progress on that. And it can take you from a long period in the training standpoint. And I'll be honest, it's relatively like safe. You know what I mean? Like, I think there's a big thing to be said of as soon as you start implementing like external load into stuff, then I think that's when you kind of start, I wouldn't say like the, the stopwatch or whatever, but like, that's when you, if I, if I do a quarter squat with a body weight squat, okay, I'm probably, I'm not getting the amount of force into my hip joint. I'm not creating whether good, bad or indifferent. As soon as I start externally loading stuff and applying more force into that hip, shoulder, ankle, and kind of compromise bad positions, that's going to have probably a negative repercussions down the line. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I can do bad stuff body weight, and it's probably not going to be as detrimental. As soon as I start doing external loading into some of those same positions, you're kind of amplifying the effects of what's going to happen down the line, in my opinion. You know what I mean? So like that's how like I try and look at it like from a like a lower back issue and other stuff. I really do think I think, and I'm sure there's people that disagree or you know whatever, but I, I for where I'm currently at, I think if you fix if you fix a lot of hips and ankles, like with kids and or you just keep what they have at 12 or 13, and then you just keep moving well in the 20s and the 30s, I think you would see a significant reduction in like lower back, other type of issues in 40 year olds, 50 year olds, 60 year olds all these other kind of issues that start happening later in life. Cause one of the things um, like I try and read a lot, I read, uh, you know, a bunch of kind of a broad range of stuff, you know, from, you know, strength conditioning stuff, a lot of stuff from business, a lot of like, um, you know, genetics, epigenetics, um, you know, different science, science areas. And like, I'll ask like, so what, like genetically, what is happening differently at 40 years old compared to 15 year olds in your ankle? You know what I mean? So like, there's, really not like when you look at epigenetics and the other stuff of like, okay, you don't get into positions, collagen deposition, other stuff. But like when you have a bad ankle, it's not probably because you have some genetic, like whatever it's because the body isn't going through the, isn't going through those positions. There isn't, uh, you know, um, forces going through to those positions or whatever, or, and I think this is like the big thing. And this is why the movement is so, so, so important. And I, I can't stress that enough. All right. Cause I know I've dealt with this. And I see it other people deal with it. Like if you can't move and you, or you can't move very well and you get to 40 or 50, how, what is the quality of your life going to be like? Oof. Like, and I'm not even talking about like whatever, but like, you're probably gonna be sitting around more. You're not going to move as much. You're probably gonna be eating more. You're gonna be snacking more. You're not going to whatever. So like movement is such the foundation to in my, a quality life and a long, a long, being able to live a long life. All right. Mm-hmm. If you start having my ankles killing me, I can't mm-hmm. even go walk for my mile. You know what I mean? As a 55 year old. All yeah. right. So what are you probably going to do? You're going to sit around. You're not going to do as much. And now you look at like from a, from a, a blood sugar standpoint, from a, a, an insulin standpoint, what is that going to do to your body? So like, if you can keep someone moving good all right now, like, again, you can be lazy and move really good. You know what I mean? But like, okay, if you can move good and I want to go for that five mile walk, or I want to go play pickleball, or I want to go, you know, play, you know, you know, in the backyard with my kid or whatever, if my joints and everything's moving good, I'm going to be able to keep that active lifestyle. And I should be able to keep that, you know, 60, 70, you might have to, you know, regress some stuff or whatever, but like, hopefully I can do that in my eighties and and plus. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that when you start getting someone like I got bad knees and I, at 47, what, like, what, what's, what's going to happen in the next 30 years? You know what I mean? Like as your, as your body, as your, as your, you know, ability to, you know, 
uh, your blood sugar and, and your other stuff starts like as you age and, and you look at what happens with as we age and how so, uh, the cell um, kind of responds to aging and just over time, mm-hmm. that's going to have a detrimental effect on that, on, on your overall health. You can look at like the neuro co- the neurocognitive components of it, like movement, all right, releases B- BDNF, right, which is like basically a fertilizer for your brain. You know what I mean? Like it's extremely important for neurogenesis. Yeah. So if I'm not moving, my, my neurocognitive you know abilities are probably going to be severely limited. You know what I mean? So like that's one of the things that I think at looking at like, okay, if you can keep someone moving good and then just keep them moving good for the next 30, 40, 50 years mm-hmm. of life, their quality of life at 50, 60, and 70 is going to have the potential to be so much higher. Or you're having a back problems at 50 or 60. Okay, it's going to be tough to like, you know what I mean? Like you're probably not going to want to even just do a whole lot. So like, that's kind of where my thought process is not even just from an athleticism standpoint, but just even from like, I guess a human longevity life standpoint. I think those are the things too, that you can start teaching kids good habits at a young age of like getting out and moving, doing this stuff. You're going to be a lot more likely to keep that stuff for the rest of your life. If you're, if you have a sedentary lifestyle, which is I think what we're seeing now with younger kids. Okay. Like at 35 and it's like, okay, you need to be more like everything works. Everything works a lot better when you're younger. You can make mistakes, like, and I say when I say mistakes, you can eat junk food and like, <laughs> oh, you're so pretty skinny, or like whatever. You can do that at 17, 18. Mm-hmm. If you start, you see that when you start at 45, you can't, your body doesn't handle it the same way, but you keep those same habits you had and you eat the same way or whatever, you same stuff. Your body is like, I'm not doing anything different, but your body's kind of worn. It's, it's, you're paying, you're not able to handle those stuff that you have. And I think that's why, especially like eating habits and all that stuff becomes, you know, super, super important. You know what I mean? Kind of like you talked about, like, it doesn't have, it's not super complicated, but if you, if your normal lunch is, you know, eating uh, a bag of Doritos and just snacking like at night and like whatever at 15, okay, uh-huh. like you're probably going, it's going to, it's, it's, it, that's probably not a good long-term habit standpoint for, for life. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I think that's kind of one of the things to, to try and look at of like, what are like the good habits that we can keep? And then how can you keep those for the rest of your life? And like, what are manageable? You know what I mean? Cause yeah. like, I know I've done keto a bunch of times and other stuff and it's like, you know, some of it too, I think is honestly like the stuff that I've done has been I really liked it, but it's also like kind of that mental challenge of like, oh man, keto, like for, you know, seven or eight weeks, you got to be like on point with like, okay, I got to, you know, meal prep everything out because it's Mm -hmm. like, whatever. Like I was, uh, that was like five years ago. I was in keto, but we were playing in Hawaii. So like, okay, you're taking a trip to Hawaii. You know what I mean? So I'm like, dude, I got my thermos, like with my, I think it was like ground beef and there was like avocado and I can't remember like olive oil or like whatever, but like, you know, you're, I can't remember how long the flight was or whatever, but I'm like. Everyone that's eating their like, you know, sandwiches or whatever. But I mean, my kid, I'm like, no, I got to eat my, my cold stuff out of my thermos or whatever. But mentally it was like, man, you know, you kind of feel like, man, I'm, I'm challenging myself. I'm mm-hmm. like going on that stuff or whatever. So I think that's where like, you know, as you go in life or like whatever, maybe you just really enjoy it. Awesome. Or whatever. But I think that's the stuff at a younger age, the movement, the nutrition, the other stuff, setting the foundations so that you're able to kind of, uh, you know, enjoy the life that you want to live and, and things along those lines. Um, so that's kind of my approach to the movement, the nutrition, the other stuff. Cause I think that that really does lay the foundation. It can change. The problem too is like you don't get uh, everybody, you know, just the way society and like, you know, government and politics, everything's looking, you know, in the next two, four, six years. Nobody really looks 20 years down the line because yeah. it doesn't, you look 20 years down the line, it's not, it's gonna, it doesn't affect your ability to get reelected. You know what I mean? Like whatever. But that's kind of the problem that we have is like if you wanna address problems 20 or 30 years down the line, you probably need to be looking at addressing it now. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I think that's one of the things, hopefully, like, with, with the information, the other stuff that becomes available, people start to kind of think about that, like, whether it's parents, kids, you know, whatever it is, and kind of, like, look at that, um, you know, in a different lens. Yeah. The spinal articulations, I saw you actually doing some of that with a kid. Like, you had a PVC pipe on one, on, oh, yeah. on like, on his lower back, and then another one on his upper back. So you you kind of mentioned that earlier, how you find that to be really important. So what is what are some of the things that you do with these kids to help them get better control over their spine? And why do you specifically do that and think it's important. The reason I ask is many coaches don't. They don't necessarily pay attention to the move of the spine, but you do. So um, so I'll start off by saying this. I don't do as much as I should, or I wish I could. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of that, I'll be honest, kind of comes back to the training efficiency standpoint of like, okay, okay, I got 35 35 or 40 minutes. Um, What, or maybe even less, sometimes 30 minutes. Like, okay, what can I get done? Okay, like, so if I'm doing, say, eight to 10 minutes of that, like, Mm -hmm. okay, now I've got 20 minutes to even just like sprint, jump, lift, you know, whatever it is. Um, so I'll be honest, I don't do as much as I, uh, I should. And I, I would like to, um, and I guess that kind of comes back to how can I be more efficient and try and figure stuff out Yeah. with that said, when I can, I like to try and incorporate as much as I can. Um, because the spine, like I said, most people, it's an area that I've seen is just so bad. Like you get people that like, like I said, push up on L3 or extend L3. And like, you see like C1, C3, C4 move, but like, you don't see anything at that actual articulation move. It's like, mm-hmm. okay. Like that bit, ba- that area is basically numb. 
You know what I mean? It's like 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 think about like ice in an ankle. That area, like your nervous system has no idea where it's at. So when we yeah. look at like micro movement feeds into global movement. So like if I can't articulate or I can't move L3, L4, L5 or whatever, all right, even when I'm moving or whatever, I'm probably going to be compensating above or below that. So that force isn't going to be going through. If I can't articulate it very well, eccentrically, isometrically, concentrically when I'm moving, mm-hmm. that 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 segment isn't going to take force, transmit force. Isn't, it's just not going to do very much. So all that force is probably going to go above, all right? Yep. So that's a good example. Um, so all that force is probably going to go above it. So like when you start having like mid back pain or, you know what I mean? Like whatever. And you're like, man, my mid back is like, well, first of all, is it your mid back? All right. Or is it because your lower back doesn't move or you don't articulate that your, your upper back is basically carrying the weight of everything. Mm. So like we need to fix the lower back and this is like thoracic rotation. So basically what the, the PVCs are doing is he's keeping, um, extension, uh, extension of the lumbar spine, and then he's trying to uh, flex the thoracic as he goes. So basically what we're doing is you see the pelvis staying straight yeah. is that you're getting that full thoracic rotation when you're going on this, right? So like I said, this is a good, really good example, but the problem is, is like this is very in-depth, articulated. Like this was like kind of more of a one-on-one setting. Mm-hmm. So like that would be, like I said, I would love to do that with everybody. But yeah. the pro- and you, then you'll get kids don't mess around or like whatever. So it kind of like defeats the purpose. Mm-hmm. But that's that's one of the things, like I said, from a spinal standpoint, most people, what are when you're looking at stuff, what are people just really bad at? And especially when you're kind of limited on time or whatever, like what are the stuff that's going to have your highest leverage points? So like spine, like I said, if your spine doesn't move very well, that's kind of a big, if you break your back, that's probably one of the worst, or like you have a back injury, that's probably one of the worst injuries you can have because you're kind of limited in what you can do. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? You can hurt your ankle. Okay, not great, but you can do, you know, you can like work around it. You can whatever. If I can't move my back. It's hard to walk. Like I can't walk. I can't Absolutely. do like whatever. Yeah. So when I look at like how well does the spine move? Because like I said, I, th- I think that's a big area of, uh, you know, trying to, uh, you know, incorporate the most I can. If I was on a more one-on-one setting, I would use it a lot, utilize it a lot more um, to be quite honest. But uh, I think it's super, super important. And it's an area I've had people honestly too, like I've had assessments. We were talking about like the FRA assessment. I had, I was doing, this was like an eye opening uh, one to me. I had our mm-hmm. women's soccer team and I was, you know, going through it. Uh, I would have some of the girls, I would tell them to like move like L5, you know, go through the lumbar spine. And then I, I didn't like whatever. And then after, you know, a couple, I asked one of them like, oh, do you feel any pain doing that? Cause I think that's good. Like, do you hurt? And he's like, yeah, that hurt. I'm like, wait, what? Like, yeah, mm-hmm. it kind of hurt when I started moving that one. I'm like, what, you're L4? She's like, no. Like when I started trying to move L4, my upper back started like my spot. I'm like, well, that's really interesting. Or whatever and so like that's where you see like okay l4 like this area doesn't move good and you're trying to move through the the, the upper back to move and it's just taking even more load because the lower back doesn't move or you'll get people that the thoracic is, is a mess mm-hmm. and the lumbar spine moves good you know what i mean so like that's where like one of the ones that i've seen and, that, and that's why i think it's so important and if you can incorporate it uh to even a more extent than i am um because like i said if you can keep the spine moving good or whatever and it's also like the articulations everything's going up into the brain yeah. you know what i mean so if the spine's not transmitting forces or it's not moving well it's really going to limit like not even just movement but also from a skill development skill acquisition standpoint about what you're able to capable to do because your body your spine is going to tell you to a certain degree where you are in space mm-hmm. and if that's messed up or it's not moving good that's going to limit the, the, those abilities that proprioception gotcha uh with like the uh like the 90 90 thing that you were showing us in the gym i have a video i'm gonna pull it up um can like if i did that on my own can i mess myself up because like when we were doing it like i said it was a, a position that i don't think i've really ever been in uh yeah no i've never been in that and it was really interesting and i thought for sure my whole hip leg and abs everything was just going to seize up and it felt like a lot of pain was about to be you know pressed upon me so I'm just curious, like if I start practicing that on my own, is there anything I need to worry about? Like, or am I fairly okay to kind of just keep leaning more into that like crampy feeling? Um, so I would say like kind of the, the uh, how I look at it or how I, I kind of go about it is mm-hmm. um, we, we don't want to feel pain. So if I'm feeling pain on something, that's like a big indicator on that. So if I'm feeling pain, mm-hmm. then I would say back off of it, you know, step back. We don't want to go through that. If it's that discomfort, crampy feeling, all right, if, and I would also ask like, what are your, uh, you know, what are your, what's your injury history? Like whatever, cause that's going to be a big one. So like if you've had chronic like hip surgeries or whatever, that completely changes it. If you're relatively healthy and you're feeling that crampy feeling, that's different. Does that make sense? So like yeah, absolutely. That, that's how, that's how I would look about it. Now at the same point too, is like if some people, like there's a lot of people that really shouldn't do, there's a lot of 90, 90 stuff. There's a lot of people that shouldn't be 90, 90 takes a lot of like external rotation of the hip and a lot of, uh, you know, just being able to get into that position. There's a lot of people, if you're super restricted and you don't move very well, 90, 90 isn't a good place to start with. Or what I would do is I would elevate the front knee. So like a common way. So like, you know, an Eric's pad or any type of like a foam roller, mm-hmm. I would put that under the front knee and that's going to be a more comfortable position. And it's a better situated position for, 
for you. So if you have knee, if, if someone has like a knee issue or something like that, I'll either elevate the, the front knee or the back knee. Cause that'll, that'll take some of the stress off the knee. If you don't have much, like I said, if your hip doesn't, you have like no hip external rotation, you try and get 90, 90, most of that like stretch and that force is going to go through your knees, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. So like, that's how I'll modify it. Like with that. So I would, I would figure out what's your injury history. What's, wh where are you feeling? Are you feeling like crampy feeling? Are you feeling like, man, this kind of feels like pain, mm -hmm. pain. Don't, we're going to, we're going to come away from that. We're going to not go there because that's not a good signal that we want. But if it's that crampy kind of, this feels uncomfortable, like whatever feeling, let's work on that. Then I think the other thing too, is like I said, trying to figure out like, if you haven't been in a position before, all right, for the most part, like I said, um, the stuff that we did, I feel relatively comfortable with because I've done this enough and I've not, you know what I mean? Like whatever. Um, now, if you haven't been in a position, generally speaking, I wouldn't want to go like, oh, you know what? I've never been here. Now let's put a thousand pounds on my back and let's, let's see kind of what happens. That mm -hmm. would be kind of my approach a little bit to that too. So like, I would tell you kind of like, you know, feel through the position, you know, gradually kind of building some stuff, but like, don't go like, like we we're saying, like the running example, like, okay, you haven't ran in whatever. Hey, I'm going to run 10 miles a day. Like, oh, okay, that's probably not a, that's probably not a, probably not a mm -hmm. good idea. And you know what? You're probably not going to, you're probably going to be on the couch in two days, you're not gonna be able to run for a month because your knees and your hips are messed up or your ankle or your Achilles or whatever it is. So I think that's, that's, that's how I would go about that. Just trying to be smart, but then making some modifications around that, um, you know, based on what your, uh, your injury history is and then what your kind of uh, joints present with. Neotropics. Every single biohacker and their mother talks about the benefits of lion's mane or alpha GPC, blah, blah, blah. We have this mix of supplement, but no one really tells you how to analyze what you actually should be trying to take or what problems you may have. That's why Andy Triana has made the Neutropics ebook now on our website at powerproject.live. Now we've had Andy on our podcast multiple times and he's educated us on so many different things along with Neutropics. But in this ebook, he goes in depth on how to analyze what your problems may be specifically and how to utilize Neutropics to help fix those issues or to help progress in certain areas. Like if you're wanting to speak better, think faster, communicate better. There's so many things he goes in depth on in this ebook, and you can get it now on our website at powerproject.live. The link's in the description along with the podcast show notes. Um, you actually, you mentioned something interesting in the gym about, you know, it, when lifting, most people focus on external rotation of the hip because squatting, et cetera. But you mentioned something about having access to that internal rotation could be something that massively helps external rotation. Why is that? Yeah. So, uh, so internal rotation is kind of like the gateway um, mm -hmm. and kind of like I talked about uh, too, there's times where I try and be really well read and kind of give good answers and like, you know, be well thought on stuff. There's also, I'll be honest sometimes too, where like, I, I can't explain something really well, but there's people that I trust and it comes back to me, you know, figuring out who you can trust or whatever. There's some stuff. And like, this is a good example of really, really smart people that I trust have kind of talked about it, explained it. It makes sense. I can't really explain the physiology of it. But um, from the the FRC or the, FR, um, the FRS uh, system, so like Michael Chivers is someone that's really good and someone that I think extremely highly of. He was one of my instructors. He's probably one of the smartest people, honestly, that um, I've ever, you know, just listened to. Michael talk. Shivers? Michael Chivers, yeah. Chivers, okay. Um, so, like, I mean, he'll be talking about how evolution relates to astrophysicists and how that relates to the joint capsule and, like, whatever, <laughs> and, like, wait what like, where are we at like i don't like okay um but you know what i mean someone like so when he says stuff like that and there's other individuals i'm like okay like I, this this makes sense i don't feel like i'm being you know taking it like out of the out of the blue but if you improve internal rotation all right it's going to uh open up space which is going to allow for potentially more external rotation and more linear motion all right so mm -hmm. a really good example on this um and this is kind of one uh that i it made sense to me so this was uh you, you use aura Yes. Okay. So I had, uh, so I've had aura for five years now. So I got it. I ordered it in January of 18 and I had to wait seven, like eight months to get it back when it was like, mm -hmm. there was a super long wait. So I got, I started using it. So I've got it close to like five years of sleep data on myself, which has been really nice. interesting. <laughs> yeah. It's super, super, uh, like interesting. Um, I can talk about that here in a second, but like I got fitted for that ring. Cause I'm trying to figure out what size I want. You got to send it or whatever. So I go to, it was a JC Penney's in Logan, Utah. All right. And I get the ring and I put it on and then I'm like, okay, like whatever. And I'm like, dude, I can't get this. Like, and it's not just like, okay, so like, no, I like, I literally can't get this, this, this. So I'm sitting there for like five minutes trying to get this ring off or whatever. And I can't get it. And then I'm like, I'm going and then I'm like trying to figure it out. And then it's, I'm like, oh, I'm starting to get a little bit. And I'm like, I, I get it. And I'm like, what am I doing? I'm like, how do you get, if something's tight, how do you get the ring off? You just kind of just relax completely. Do you start twisting? Well, I mean, I twist and I like, so you twist, so, so you twist. A so you're bit. so so you're creating some rotation mm -hmm. to open up that linear to open up space. Yeah. 
if you will. So that's the that's the example or the analogy I use, like when I'm talking about why rotation is so important for linear motion. So like if I can't get this and I pull it, I'm not going anywhere. But if I start applying a little bit of linear rotation or rotation while going into that, mm -hmm. it comes off. It's the same kind of concept. You know what I mean? So if I have a if I my hip, uh, flexion extension is is restricted, I don't have space within our articulation. So like if I'm trying to go here and there's no space. Right, I need to create more space so that I can do this and I can do this. Mm -hmm. So if I if I hammer internal rotation, I'm opening up space within the joint to be able to now move internal or I'm sorry, uh, linear um, flexion extension and then external and internal. So like that's that's the reason, kind of the analogy that I use of why internal rotation is so important. So you create space because most one of the the main problem generally like with passive range of motion, you don't have space. So you have to have space yeah. within the articulation to be able to move. So if you don't have space. You have to find way. You have to find ways to create more space within that articulation to create movement, and that's why, like the pails and rails that I showed you for the internal rotation, mm -hmm. that is going to help free open space. So now that we can we can move and we have more uh, basically access to to be able to 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 have more range of motion, if you will. And I also think that uh, just internal rotation, like a little bit in general, like just is like tighten, like tighten it up, you know, and then loosen it up with external rotation. Yep. Like it's like you're opening up. Yep, exactly. And I think internal too is like, it's such internal and external, especially for the hip is really important. But if, like, you're, if you're restricted internal rotation, like it's going to the knee, you know, it's probably going to the knee. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So like, okay, if you will, like from an ACL, MCL, whatever standpoint, like you want to have a really good, um, you know, this was a good example that, uh, you know, it was a different system, but like DNS, dynamic neuromuscular stabilization, the, the individual that taught my course was the St. Louis Cardinals uh, chiropractor for like, you know, a long time. So he, a lot of his examples were sport specific mm -hmm. examples. And he talked about internal rotation and like uh, Alex Rodriguez and Tiger Woods, their their injuries were very, very similar. And they both, the, the nature and the velocity and the forces that they produced, whether it was Tiger's golf swing or A-Rod swing were just ridiculous. You know what I mean? And that's what made, helped, one of the things that made them so good at what they did. Yeah. But what having that amount of force required a lot, like ton of internal rotation of the hip. You know what I mean? So like mm. you might look at your standards and that's why it might be like, okay, the, whatever your is, oh, you need 15 or 20 degrees or whatever internal rotation. Okay. That's probably for a general, like generally that's good. But if you're talking about someone that like has a very unique skill set, you know what I mean? Like a rubber guard, like, oh, okay. It says you need 80 degrees of external rotation, but if you want to do rubber guard or whatever, you probably need even more, like yeah. you need whatever. So like both their injuries were very, uh, you know, similar in terms of they both required a ton of internal rotation because that femur was just basically slam, slamming into the pelvis mm -hmm. or whatever. So if you don't have even that like high, high level, that's when you start, you know, getting those, those types of injuries to happen, if you will. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of the things too, of like looking at like what's, what's your skill development, what's your, uh, you know, especially with higher level athletes, like what is the, the things that you do? What does that require? And so like, even like the bigger, like, okay, if you're driving, you know, 60 miles an hour, that's what your car tops out at. Like your brakes are what they are. If you're driving, you know, you know, 200 miles an hour, your brakes better be able to handle, you know, a lot yeah. higher, a lot higher speeds or whatever. So that's one of the things like with the internal rotation is like, you want to make sure that you've got a good amount passively and actively, especially from a, a knee injury standpoint to be able to protect the knee, um, you know, especially from an athletic standpoint, because knee injuries, you know, I mean, those can be life or game, you know, career changing, mm -hmm. if you will. So if you can keep the hip moving good, you know, it helps, uh, you know, helps keep the athlete on the field, which is what we talked about is probably one of the most important things. Got it. Is nutrition anything that you end up talking about a whole lot? Um, in college, absolutely. It was huge. Um, I'll be honest. High school, yes, to a certain degree. Um, but I'll be honest, like there is – I try and tread lightly on that, and it's not because it's not important or whatever. Kind of like I think – with social media and other stuff with kids, it can be very, you can say something well-meaning and can be taken like a bad, like just a negative way. So one of the things like I'm very like, even at like college, like just deal like, you know, uh, with eating disorders and other stuff like that, where like I try and be, I had to deal not with that specifically, but like other situations where other, you know, something was said, not negative, you know, not intended like that, but it was kind of taken that way. And, you know, there was like there was serious repercussions, you know what I mean, with people's lives and that. So like, that's one of the things I try and be very, very general with that um, and not try and be very self-conscious of that, to be honest, because that's kind of one of my, uh, I guess, fears, if you will, is that you say something and then a, a kid thinks, even so, I try and be very specific, yeah. like with, with, with specific, like, okay, you should be drinking water all the time, right? No, you shouldn't be drinking three gallons a day. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, and it's yeah. not like whatever, but like, you, like, that's like, I try and be very specific, like if I'm giving recommendations to be like, oh, no one's ever going to think about doing, you know what I mean? Like whatever, just because you know, you're talking to 12 to, 18 year old kids or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. but I think it's like really important. I think the, the big area that I really focus on, or I think is extremely critical is sleep. Right. And like sleep and we can look at like just the, all the benefits and this is kind of where the aura, like it's been super beneficial for me. Cause like, I know 
I've been doing it for so long. That, okay, HRV, this might be up or down, but I have pretty good standards. Like, where's my sleep at? Like, you know, like whatever. I see something like, oh crap. Like, yeah. I've been doing something for five years and I see a number I've never seen before. Like, mm-hmm. whether it's good or bad, it's like, okay, that's different. That's telling me something or yeah. whatever. Um, so like a really good like example, and I think this is one of the probably the if you ask me, and this has probably changed over the last like two months uh, because of doing this, probably one of the biggest health things that people could do if you just gave like one something, one, one general thing, all right. Stop drinking coffee and caffeine after like 11 a.m right so i'm gonna the the half-life of caffeine is about i think eight hours Mm -hmm. so like half the caffeine if you have a cup of coffee at noon half that caffeine still in your body 8 p.m the quarter life is around 12 hours so if you have a cup of coffee at 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 noon a quarter of that caffeine still in your body at midnight all right when i drive through and i see this all the time and it's probably if you're an investor in a starbucks probably not what you want to hear or whatever but like how often you drive by a starbucks or whatever and it's like three o'clock it's like dude why is the long line so long for coffee Mm -hmm. at three o'clock in the afternoon i gave up caffeine for lent um uh during like the religious you know period if you will that's 30 days right uh it was is lent a month or no it was six uh it was six weeks plus days so i think it was 40 i think it was 47 days i think um if i remember correctly but so like I was always like I don't need caffeine like it's not like I, I like drinking I like drinking my cup of coffee in the morning kind of wake me up I'm someone that like I don't like rushing out of the door so I'll give myself extra time to like wake up even if it's less sleep because I want to sit down for 10 15 minutes drink my coffee kind of just re- you know get and then get, get get on you know with everything um, so like that was what I liked yeah. I'll be honest the first three or four days like. I was struggling big time. Like, I, I was like, dude, like, what? Like, I'm, I'm literally, I'm having trouble staying awake at, like, 9 a.m., yeah. <laughs> yawning at, like, at like 8 o'clock. I'm like, dude, I'm going to bed. Like, I can't, like, whatever. I was struggling big time with it. Then I started after, like, three or four days. I'm like, okay, let's try, like, tea or whatever. So I got into, like, black tea, and I was like, okay, this, that actually, I went to that, and it was just enough caffeine where I was like, okay, this is good. Mm-hmm. I still feel really tired at night, like, 8, 9 o'clock. I'm like, dude, I'm ready to go to sleep or whatever. Yeah. So I went to that, and honestly, towards the end, I was like, I, I didn't need ca- I didn't need co- like I was like I could if, if I never had coffee again for the rest of my life I'd be okay with tea like whatever um, but anyway my sleep the last like first couple months of the year before Lent started was like oh man like why is like my heart rates you know up like you know 51 52 which is normally like you know mid you know 43 to 48 is kind of my range so my heart I'm like dude I'm not I'm trying to focus on some other stuff I'm like my reco- I'm like why is my heart rate so elevated my HRV is kind of crappy my sleep's just been bad mm-hmm. um, for the first two months of the year I cut the caffeine out. All right. And then I'm like, after the first, like, like we or whatever, I'm like, dude, I'm back down to like 43s, 44s, like all this other stuff. My numbers are like, just like my sleep every night is like phenomenal or whatever. That was the only thing I changed or whatever. And I've been doing this for five years. Like I said, it was like, this has probably been one of the best stretches of sleep I've had in five years. And I was like, man, this is like really eye opening for the amount of like caffeine. Cause I, generally what I would do is, you know, if I, if I would have my first cup at 5 a.m. or what kind of depending on the day, but say 5 a.m., yeah. I was someone that I would drink my cup, then I would take my, my thermos or whatever with me. I'd sip on, you know, just sip, you know, during the day. So I have another 20, 25 ounces, you know, over a four or five hour period. I try and cut off like 11 a.m., but you know, just get down to your desk. I, I just enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. And so, like, I would still have caffeine in my body, you know, until, you know, midnight or, you know, plus, you know, just with, when you're looking at like the half life and quarter life. I was like, you know what? I needed to stop. Like, so I, I changed and I was like, I'm just going to have my coffee like right when I wake up. So like 5 a.m. And I'm kind of done, you know, generally 5.30, 5.45. So like now even like it's good through the morning, afternoon, but I'll still be like, oh man, four o'clock, I'm starting to kind of feel it. And it, like when I go like at night, I'm like, dude, I'm tired it's and I want to go to bed. Yeah. And my sleep still stayed where it is. So like coming full story on that, it was like, man, you know what? Like that, I, I never would have, if I wouldn't have given up, I probably would just kept doing that. But like just cutting the caffeine earlier in the day mm-hmm. is probably one of the best things. I think when you just look at the benefits of sleep, people waking up during the night, like, yeah, you shouldn't be waking up in the middle of the night. Like that's not normal. Like you should be able to sleep through the night. You have trouble falling asleep. Like I think, I can't remember the book. It was, a uh, uh, but it's basically like the neuroscience of sleep, um, along those lines. But it was like, there's three things I think that, that like a researcher, someone had like to all cause mortality or like whatever related to sleep. And it was like sleep efficiency below 85%. So like you sleep seven hours, whatever, 85% of that, you should be asleep, whatever that time. Cause most of that, even if you don't like whatever, you're not going to be asleep the whole time or whatever. Mm-hmm. The second one I believe was like, um, an abnormally low or large amount of REM sleep. So like very, very small or very, very, a ton of REM sleep. And I think the third one was regularly takes like more than like 15 minutes to fall asleep, something like that. And mm-hmm. like most people like, this is what like, oh, wait, so I shouldn't be sitting in bed for like an hour trying to fall asleep. <laughs> like, yeah, no, that's not, 
that's not normal. Like yeah. you're probably either your heart rate and this is one most people they go to bed and their heart rate's way too elevated. So like, okay, your heart rate's way too elevated. And I can tell too, like when my heart's beating fast, I'm like, gosh dang it. Like it's gonna take me a while to fall asleep, calm down. Are you on your phone? Like, did you just eat did you eat too close to bed? That's a big mm-hmm. one for me. Like people eat way too close to bed. Um, so like I, I try and set that up to where I'm eating, you know, an earlier dinner. Um, you know, how much cell phone, what was your cell phone? You know, were you working, like, were you working out Were you like, whatever, what can you do to calm your heart rate down? So like for me, I try and read two books at a time. One, like in the morning is when I'm more focused is more like kind of, you know, in depth. The one in the evening is more just like a biography or something. That's not, I don't have to critically think about it. It's kind of more relaxing. I put my phone down and it helps me, you know, calm myself down to fall asleep yeah. or whatever. So I think that's one of like, when you look at like the caffeine consumption, cutting that out earlier in the day, I think for most people would probably have a, as good of effect on their lives when you look at what sleep does falling asleep you know all the other you know hormonal aspects of good quality sleep mm-hmm. uh, you know with that so uh, you know i'm sure people can argue that and i'm you know open to change that or whatever but i think honestly like if you can just cut the number of people that are drinking coffee past like noon yeah you know what i mean like mm-hmm. i would think you would see s- significant improvements across the board on a lot of health markers for most of most of people we love it though <laughs> it is yeah, yeah. I mean, it's pretty it's tasty too too delicious mm-hmm. so you're you're um being in Texas, you're, you know, people are fanatical about football, right? And so you're hired by like a local high school. Is that normal in the area to have strength coaches um, at the high school? I would say uh, it's somewhat and it's becoming more normal. Mm-hmm. Um, I think one of the things too is is kind of to that point of, uh, you know, as – some of the facilities keep expanding. So like there's, uh, you know, becoming some really, really nice facilities, like in terms of like better than a lot of colleges and stuff like that. So it's like, uh, if schools are, are, you know, going to have this like, you know, multi-million dollar weight room and like this, you know, indoor facilities and stuff like that, but you don't really have anybody to like, actually like, Oh man, we have like, you know, 30 racks, but you don't really have anyone to coach Mm -hmm. that. It's kind of not that benefit. You know what I mean? Like you're kind of limited or whatever. So those positions are becoming a lot more, um, prevalent. I think it also too, one of the things is like looking at it, like when you look at just the numbers of like, cause it's not just high school, but like your junior high. So like I said, we have two feeder junior highs and we have other stuff. So like, you know, the number of kids that I work with, like I'll, it's probably more than anybody. Like you go to any school, like you're, you're a teacher, you're a principal, like the number of daily contacts that I have, it's probably higher than anybody else. You know what I mean? Just in terms of the number of kids, maybe it's 10 minutes, five minutes, 30 minutes or whatever, but you're around, that large number of kids. So I think the benefits, and like I said, um, I think it's starting to become more normal. And I think other states are starting to kind of expand into that. So like uh, SoCal, um, some of the, the the private schools down in Southern California are starting to make some, uh, you know, a lot of investments into that. Um, there's other areas that's becoming more prevalent, um, you know, as well. Um, so Texas, I would say, you still see it ones of the, like the football coach, strength mm-hmm. coach. You're still like, that's not, um, that hasn't like gone away per se, not saying, you know, throwing people under the bus or whatever, but there is becoming more like full time positions from from a strength conditioning standpoint. Cool. Is that all we got? I yeah. think so. All right, Andrew, take mm-hmm. us on out of here, buddy. All righty. Thank you, everybody, for checking out today's episode. Please make sure you guys slap Ooh. that like button. And we have one more question. So I do, on. actually, because, like, <laughs> you know, you were talking about all the different certifications that you've you've gotten. And oh, a lot yeah. of coaches listen to the podcast. So if you were to rank some of the certifications that have really helped you and helped you, like, apply these things to the people you work with, what would be your top three or top five? Um, I would probably start out with, with the FRC, um, certification. I think that's probably one, been one of the best, the best ones I've taken personally that's, uh, you know, had a huge effect on me. Mm -hmm. Um, that's from the functional range systems, uh, system, I guess, if you will. Second one, um, I would say probably um, the sp- Speedworks is Jonas to do the one I was kind of talking about. Um, yeah. He's got some different products, but his was I, I, I took a lot of stuff from him that was really good on the speed development aspect. So that'd probably be my second one. Mm-hmm. Um, my third one, um, oh, I'm, I hadn't talked about. Uh, uh, so I've taken courses from Charles Poliquin. Yeah. Um, so I'd, I'd be remiss not to say that because he's had a huge impact and a lot of what he does, you know, um, you know, applies to what I do. Um, so I took uh, in metabolic analytics, which was. Um, uh, basically like his uh, nutrition, body fat, uh, body composition course. And I've mm-hmm. taken like a private, uh, you know, internship class with him, um, you know, as well. So I would say like the Poliquin stuff would be like the, uh, the third one, if you will. Um, maybe now that I think about that, maybe they're all, they're all really good, um, you know, <laughs> with that. But like, uh, as you can see, probably with the squats, you know, I've kind of mentioned this as well as I think like one of the things, if you see, uh, you know, r- you know, Poliquin's obviously like a very controversial you know, figure, mm-hmm. you know, um, but I will say like, I think at the mark of a good coach or a really good, you know, high level, uh, you know, individual is when you see someone that does like a poliquin or whatever, right? Like generally it's like, man, that that's really good. You know, that's really good squat. You know, those, those movements are really good. And I think that's one of the things you can see a lot of people now do a bunch of certifications or whatever. And it's kind of like the more you like scale up on some of that stuff, it's harder to, 
to really get like the true, I guess, practitioners, if you will. So it might be, and I see this with other stuff. It's like, you could be a good course, but if everyone's got that certification, you're going to get people that aren't good at it yeah. or whatever. And I think that's the one thing with Poliquin is you see people that have an extensive Poliquin background. It's like, okay, those squats, that's a really good squat. Like that's really good right there. And I think that's a, a credit in it, uh, to what, how he taught and his teaching system and kind of, uh, you know, what he did, you know, with that. So I just want to kind of highlight that. Um, but those would probably be the three courses that I would look at. And I'll be honest, hopefully, um, you know, it's probably going to change. You know, hopefully a year or two from now or whatever, yeah. as you, you know, you take more courses, you learn, you kind of expand yourself and not trying to, you know, just get stuck into like the old ways and how you've always done that stuff. I yes. think that'd probably be, you know, one of the biggest, not to keep, you know, talking, which I'm pretty good at, um, <laughs> <laughs> You're fine, dude. Uh, yeah, but, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, you can look back at like some of those videos. Like, I think my training philosophies, I wouldn't say it's like completely shifted every year, but like it's different. What I'm saying right now is different than it was a year ago. And it's different yeah. than it was two years ago. As you can probably see some of the older videos and three years ago and four years ago. And it's probably gonna be different a year from now. And mm -hmm. some of it too is like what you're learning and what I'm whatever, but it's also stuff of like, man, that I thought that would work out better. Like that we were doing this or we changed this up and I thought it would be better two years down the line. It's not. Okay, well, that's a good, that's an experience that I can draw from. I'm seeing that firsthand. Yeah. That's going to change my philosophy. You know what I mean? All that, some of that stuff. Um, so, like, that's one of the things I just, you know, like, if I keep if what I'm saying a year from now is different or I give different courses, that's probably a good thing because I've expanded Absolutely. as a coach. I've evolved, and I'm not trying to get pigeonholed into one, you know, idea or, or framework, if you will. So, uh, the last thing I forgot, because you didn't ask me about my shirt. It's a beautiful shirt. You gave it to me. Oh, I did. Yeah. So like this is so I'm give, really big. Give it back. No, so, so, so it's actually funny because one of the one of the uh, one of the hip mobility drills. Um, this was 2019. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, one of somebody uh, from your company like reached out to me on Instagram and was like, I "Love what you do. Mark loves what you do. Want to send you some stuff." Boom, boom. I was like, "Okay." Like no strings attached. Like sent me you know this shirt, some other stuff. But then they uh, had that note in there as well. Oh, cool. So uh, this. Uh, Awesome. Yeah, this was Jessica. No. Very cool. So Thank like you. I said, so like I said, it was very like I said, and well, that's one of the things I tried like when you get notes and cards, like it yeah. means like you didn't have to, you know, do that, or it was like wasn't asking for like anything in return or whatever. But like I said, I think it's obviously a credit to to you. That's cool. And that people, you saved like, it. like I said, no, yeah, like I said, it was really mad at it. Cool, and I'll be honest, I really like the shirt because it's got <laughs> mm -hmm. it's got kind of that tight, so it makes your biceps look good. It's yep. one of my favorite shirts, uh, whatever. But yeah, it's just kind of <laughs> coming come, come full circle on that. So I really do appreciate it. But yeah, awesome, yeah. thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Do you have a way for people to like learn from you? Um, so if you go, uh, I guess my social media right now, I've got, I'm in the process of getting a, a you know a website and some other stuff put together. Um, I've got, I should be live right now, um, but it's kind of a youth course uh if you will so it's or it's a it's a youth program so my video demos the program um so it's kind of geared towards kind of like i was talking about for parents that like don't have any background on it but like here's the demos here's how you do the exercise here's what to look for here's how to regress progress so that should be available so like i said if you want to start and it's kind of geared towards you know everybody but like okay you're in the middle of nowhere in montana i don't have, really have anybody or whatever like yeah. what can i do in the backyard or my gym you know with my kid so that's available and i'll have some other stuff uh coming available as well nice. but like the social media where we'll, where all that information will be at so uh yeah Cool. cool. Andrew, take us on out of here, buddy. All right. Make sure you guys like, subscribe, and comment. I want to hear from all the coaches in the house. Uh, drop those comments down, down below. Let us know what you guys think about today's conversation. Follow the podcast at MB Power Project all over the place. My Instagram's at I am Andrew Z and Sima. Where you at? Discord's down below at Nsima and Yang on Instagram and YouTube at Nsima and Yang on TikTok and Twitter. Joey, where can people find you? Because you just mentioned it, but where can people find you? Uh, so all my social media is at my first and my last name. So at J O U I Burglis B E R G L E S. Uh, Burglis, not yeah. Burglis. It's common. It's common. You're right. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I'm on Instagram, uh, Twitter, TikTok, and YouTube. Um, so I think that's about it. Nice. You're gonna have to write a book or something. <laughs> People need to find out this information. Yeah. I'm at Mark Smelly Bell. Strength is never weakness. Weakness is never strength. Catch you guys later. Bye.